All righty, guys. This is Jim Collins with another episode of Journey to the Pit. Uh, we got another hotly uh, attested uh, interview coming up. Uh, many of y'all guys are really looking forward to this interview, as we do with all of them. But we got Tonio uh, from Philippines that's coming on. Many of y'all guys know him from other parts of the world. Um, a lot of guys here from the States and Hawaii and also Guam uh, know the next guest that we have coming up. It's going to be a great, great show. Uh, he's going to be able to give us some inside information on how life is in the Philippines. I know here in the States that many of us, uh, uh, you know, follow a lot of things that's going on in the Philippines. And many will probably never be able to get there. So Antonio is going to come on this evening and kind of give us some inside information and how the life is of a game foul uh, breeder out there in the Philippines. So I'm about to bring him on to the show and uh, so we can get this thing started. As y'all guys know, this is um, Journey to the Pit Marathon, one of 10 interviews we've been doing back to back to back. Our last interview will be on April 2nd. It will be the last of the 10, 10 interview series. So let's go ahead and get this thing started. Let me bring in our special guest tonight, and uh, we'll get this interview ready to rock and roll. He's coming on in two, one. Hello, Tonio. How you doing this evening? Hi. Hi. I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Uh, well, well I, I guess it's morning evening it's on morning. our end. Yeah, yeah. right. I was, I was about to say it's morning on your end, but evening on our end. Yeah. That's uh, so what's... the power of the internet for you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> That's exactly right. So what, what time is it over there? Uh, I think it's about 9, 9 a.m. Okay, okay. So we're about a 12-hour difference from Eastern Standard Time, yeah. huh? It's like 9, 9, 10. Right now. Okay, about nine ten. Well, yeah. listen, uh, before we get started, I always say a disclaimer, uh, which is most likely not needed in the Philippines, but we always put a disclaimer out there. So let me say the disclaimer before we get the interview started. All the information discussed in this interview is for historical, educational, entertainment purposes only. None of this information is intended for any illegal purposes, and all opinions are respected of the individual. So, once again, welcome to the show, Journey to the Pit. Hopefully you have seen the show before and enjoy it, but uh, it's a pleasure having you on this evening. Oh, yeah. I enjoy your show very much, and uh, thanks for having us on, and I okay. uh, hope we can... Uh, uh, Satisfy all the viewers if uh, you know answer to the best of our abilities or whatever. I'm yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you will. You know, many many people looked out um and and, and requested you come on. Jay Sanchez from Guam is the one that kind of put it together. He made it possible, so I like to give a shout out to him. Uh, he yeah. reached out to me and said, "Hey, you know, won't you get this guy on?" I'm like, "Well, I really don't know him." He's like, "Don't worry about it. I'll make a call and we'll make it happen." And um. When he reached out to you, you accepted the invitation. I really appreciate that. And I think we all do. Everybody watching appreciate you coming on the show this evening. Well, this morning, um, depending on where you located. it. Well, yeah. listen, uh, so this is how we're going to get it started. Typically, you know, just just kind of, you know, I like to kind of build a story so we can kind of walk through the whole deal. You know, uh, a lot of people watching do not know you. So I like to kind of start at the beginning, you know. Tell us a little bit about you. You know, are you a second generation cocker, first generation cocker? And, uh, you know, we'll kind of walk it from there. Oh, well, uh, I'm a second generation cocker. Uh, I've been around the, the chickens uh, all my life. My, my father's, uh, he got into cockfighting in the late 70s. Okay. And, uh, and seriously into like breeding in the early 80s. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I came along in the late 80s, and so I've been around the chickens a, a long time, <laughs> even though a I'm... A long time. Yeah, even though right. I'm still kind of... I'd like to think I'm still young, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but like, well, listen, yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about this, you know, since, since you said you're a second generation. Let's start off with just speaking, of, you know, you telling us a little bit about your father. Um, oh. The audio good? Yeah, sometimes it's a bit loud. I'm just trying to find okay. the right volume. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's start off since you're second generation. You know, let's start off with your history. Are you telling us a little bit about your father, his name, you know, his farm name, and that kind of stuff. You know, so we can kind of see what you was born into. Okay. Uh, my, my father, he's named uh, Mike Romulo or uh, Miguel Romulo, and okay. uh, I think I believe he got into chickens about uh, seventy eight, seventy nine, something like okay. that. When he was, when he was a teenager, a late teenager, uh, maybe. Uh, and the farm is called uh, Mika Antonio Game Farm. Uh, 
that's named okay. after uh, me and uh, uh, my sister. So it's okay. like a fam family operation. Uh, me and my dad, we work together on the farm and uh, okay. uh, we uh, help each other breeding, conditioning. And of course, uh, uh, we have a lot of help too managing a farm here in the Philippines. It's kind of different out right. here than in the States. But uh, right. my dad was, uh, when he started and he got serious into chicken fighting, he actually got backing from his mother, my grandmother. Wow. And uh, they went to the States. They, uh, they acquired bloodlines. And my dad's uh, partner in cockfighting, aside from his mother, was eventually going to be his brother-in-law, my, my uh, wow. mom's dad. Yeah. So they were like a, a partnership. My dad, my uncle, and my grandma. And they were uh, wow. uh, regulars in the States, in the U.S., mm -hmm. like uh, in the 80s to the 90s. They'd, they'd go mm -hmm. almost every year, and they'd, uh, they'd, they'd join derbies out there with their friends and stuff. Wow. Uh, so they actually came to the States and competed back in the 80s, huh? Yes, yes. And uh, he's been around there. My, they're quite familiar with... Uh, a lot of like the the, the big name uh, chicken fighters from from before, yeah. And right. uh, so when I I grew up as a kid, I'd always uh, go see, I'd be with them and see the birds, and uh, I never quite knew what they were really. Just like oh, these like pet chickens, but I'd see them spar. They'd always mm -hmm. take me to the sparring, and uh, mm -hmm. eventually, like you know, you learn more, you get more involved. And uh, no, no turning back. You're gonna reach a point where you can't turn back. You're in it like all the way, right? <laughs> That's right. You got that right. Once it's like it's almost like an addiction. Once you get exposed to it, you enjoy it. It's like you can't never give it up anymore. They they brought me to the pit. Uh, I saw my first fight as a, like an infant, not even one year old. They'd bring me to the cockpit, and they they said I'd get so excited with all the people calling the bets. I'd, I'd jump up and raise my hands like. Like uh, here, wow, we're, they're called Christos, like the bet callers. Uh -huh. they, they they hold out their hands and they make hand signals to make the bets. Uh -huh. And they I, they said at like a young age, I was copying them. <laughs> wow. So I was you like, said as a baby, you was yeah. in there. You was already getting into the yeah. groove and getting into the motion of it, huh? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, as far as I can remember, I've always been around chickens and, and, and cockfighting. Wow. Well, well, tell me this, Tonio. You know, what bloodlines? Obviously, you was, you was an infant born into it. You know, back then, now that you're grown, reflecting back, you know, what kind of bloodlines did your father have when you was born, you know, when you was growing up as a child? Uh, well, uh, mostly like my father breeds uh, the chickens from uh, Bobby Joe Manziel, the, the, the famous mm -hmm. uh, breeder from Texas. And uh, we kind of... Uh, mm -hmm breed his lions here up to today so we concentrate mostly on the grays and the hatches and the clarets uh, those three wow. lions have been ar around uh on our farm at least since the 80s uh wow as a boy the first ones i'd really remember what stood out were the spangled hatches those were like mm -hmm. my favorites when i was a kid and he also had like these great i remember the chickens before they used to be much bigger right there's a lot of imported chickens before now like mostly locally bred but before the chickens were so big and like uh we had like these grays like dark mm -hmm. dark eyes grays with really dark eyes i remember those when i was a kid and like wine red reds white legged reds right yeah those are like the three chickens i remember when i was young and fortunately, I guess, and, and luckily, I, well, we still have those lions today on the farm. And uh, they're like the cornerstone of our breeding, really. Those wow. three lions. So you, okay, so you, you all guys are pretty much just continue on what y'all guys started out with back in the 80s, huh? Y'all still running those same lines today? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh, that's like uh, part of the fun, right? Trying to be able to maintain the old lines, like... We even have some like families. We don't. We just keep him around, keep him on the side, like. And then you never right. know. Like one day you might want to cross him in. At least you know you got like the, you got all those options already on your yard, right? And they already proven options. So it's like proven yeah. options that you have there, right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Especially now, like being in the Philippines, 
uh, with price of shipping and like the situation in the states it's like it's not as easy to keep a uh, track of what's right. uh what's going on over there or what what uh right. what bloodlines and and right. by now the style of fighting is like it's so different right it, it is, is completely huh? it's a different. lot different than what yeah. it was back in the 80s huh yeah so it's much i'd say today it's much harder to find something that will uh immediately suit your breeding program here in the philippines yeah okay so you got it you at least you abroad have to... at least abroad mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so so basically you would have to you kind of saying you know uh, at this present time now with the style and stuff like that in the philippines the size of the chickens and everything if you imported something in it would probably take you a couple years to kind of get it to where you would need it that be uh for the philippines huh yeah especially if it's something like totally different right like if you're not like uh Maybe it would be different if, like, you're refreshing your blood or uh, right. it's a similar family. But, like, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, if I were starting from scratch, I, I wouldn't know where to go right now, honestly. Right. Right. Yeah. So, 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 basically, most the majority of y'all birds there are just locally bred. Yes. Yes. Uh, totally. 98%. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's a okay. big so difference. Those... When I was much younger, a lot of people would fight imported chickens, but like the cost has gone up, gone up tremendously too, mm -hmm. and also the ability of the local chickens is uh, really gone up. Like they're they're, they're the some quality, else. huh? Yeah, it's it's super tough out here. They're uh, spe these chickens are specialized for for uh, the long knife, the Philippine style of long knife, at least. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and that's that's that. You know, I guess that was. Um... That was eventually going to come. I'm, you know, I would think that you know any place that started importing birds are going to pretty much uh, breed them to cater their style uh, that they yeah, have locally. Exactly. So that's pretty much what y'all guys did, and y'all been at it for decades. So it's not like y'all just started it 10, 15 yeah. years ago. Y'all been tweaking these chickens and tweaking these these breeding programs to fit the style that y'all guys are competing in. Yeah, correct, correct, and it's always evolving, like. Uh, every, I'd say five five years, the type of chicken that's winning in the pit here is is different. Is wow! It, it, it keeps evolving here, so you gotta like what? stay on top of things. You gotta attend a lot of fights, and you gotta watch, and yeah, you gotta keep constantly keep an eye on what's winning and what is it going to take to win. Yeah, look for like uh, it's more of like a matter of finding the bird with the right style for the right moment, right? Mm -hmm. Even the right pit, like you might want to find fight a different bird in a different pit here, because like in a certain pit, these birds tend to win, right? We'll right. see. Uh, it's, it's different. It's well, different. I, I, it is different. Well, it, I guess it keep y'all guys on your toes, and y'all have to stay open minded. You know, you have to stay yes. open minded to try new things. The constant. So basically, y'all guys always have to be like researching, developing. Y'all researching, going out there, checking to see what's up. You know, and yeah. then y'all coming back to the farm and y'all y'all trying different things, different crosses with different yep. birds to try to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, and you got to do that while maintaining your your proven stock. You can't get away from your right. proven stock, right? So, yeah, this presents a lot of challenges. Yeah. Right. Well, it, it definitely presents a lot of challenges. So tell me. So, you know, um, basically you then kind of walked us through with the bloodlines y'all have today. Y'all just been working on them since the 80s. You know, started off the, with that foundation and kind of been tweaking it and working on it since the 80s uh, to now. And like you say, even till today, y'all still had to keep refining them so y'all guys don't fall behind the curve. So, yeah, yeah. Go so ahead. tell me what? this. How, how, how large is y'all guys farm? Like how many, you know, how many do y'all hatch every year and raise, you know? Well, well, I, I try and raise about uh for Philippine standards, I got like a, a small farm for what to mm -hmm. one that competes at like uh, I guess the major circuit or whatever. But uh, I'll get about three hundred stags a year. That's a lot already okay. for me. Like maybe right. more realistic number like two eighty, right? Okay. I produce okay. yeah two eighty to three hundred a year, and, and often on busy throughout the season. I'll have like uh, five hundred birds on cord. That's about okay. right. 500, 600, something like okay, that. Okay, okay. So that, that pretty much maintain y'all guys, keep y'all active for the season. Oh, oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, I've, I'm very busy. Actually, I, uh, 
I manage a uh, cockpit now. So, like, I fight four times a week. Yeah, man. I'm so busy fighting chickens. Before, wow. uh, I used to be, I used to breed, I used to compete uh, major derbies and stuff. So, right. more right. time to prepare, I could select. Uh, and I'd have a lot to sell, too. But um, now, I, I just got to join, like, I got to fight a lot. Six to ten chickens a week, <laughs> so wow. super busy. Yeah, super busy. Wow, <laughs> super busy. Exactly, exactly. But yeah. you still kind of you still using your same ch- your own chickens, correct? Yes, yes. Oh, only my, my own chickens, really. Uh, if right. ever I I get some um, from my uncle, uh, right? He he breeds the same chickens as I do. Like he helps us out sometimes when we're we're short on chickens, like end of the season and stuff. Right, my dad's cousin. And I, I get a few imported stew from my my friends. They, okay. They, they, yeah, but we use those like when they come over, they want to fight uh, like World Slasher Cup pit master. So right. like yeah, we help each other out there. Like we show their chickens in the big fights too. But gotcha, uh, yeah, gotcha. mostly it's all all my breeding. Uh, like like I said earlier, like ninety nine high ninety percent is all mine. Right. Right, and you said typically between 280 and 300 stags are, are carry y'all guys through the season every year. Yeah, I bet a bit less this year that they had that volcano that erupted earlier in the year. So mm-hmm. I think production might be affected a bit this year. We're behind. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah. so tell me this, Antonio. What, what's the climate like over there? Well, Philippines got two seasons, uh, rainy season and, and summer, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, now summer is starting to begin, right? So... It can get pretty hot out here and humid uh, in right. Fahrenheit. It's about, uh, I live uh, a little south of Manila. Okay. It's about, let's say, 95 degrees, the hottest it'll get. Okay. But uh, in the city, like, uh, you'll reach 100 degrees, 98, high 90s in the summertime. Wow. wow. And that's about uh, March till about, it'll start to rain in May, but that's still summer. June, July, then the rains will come and the malt. We, our chickens here molt during the rainy season. Well, it's summertime in the States, too. So they molt around right. the same time. Right. But, yeah, we don't stop fighting chickens in the Philippines. It's a year-round thing. Yeah, yeah they, see, that, that, that's got, what I was getting to as far as the climate. So y'all guys show 12 months out the year. Yeah, 12 months. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it reminds me of like, you know, when I tell guys uh, when I'm living in Puerto Rico and I tell guys, oh, we show 12 months out the year. And they're like, 12 months out the year? How do you how do you show 12 months out the year? That's impossible. I'm like, well, you know, with the climate, birds molt. Not all the birds molt at the same time. And birds are born different times of the year. So yeah. there we got stag season, which is, you know, Puerto Rican birds show at a lot, lot of uh, a, a younger age. But. We show stags from July 15th to November 1st. That's all stags. That means the birds can't be trimmed. Their combs can't be cut. Their waddles, oh. nothing can be cut. They got to be fully feathered. So so there, so y'all basically show 12 months out the year, and is it because of that same reason? The climate allows y'all guys to have birds ready throughout different times of the year? That too, and like the popularity of the stag derbies has uh, changed the breeding season, right? Okay. So there's like... Um, before it used to be like uh, the cock season start like late November, but typically really December, and that okay. will go till about uh, July, with some like you know like some derbies or uh, hack fights. They go all all year round. They'll fight molting cocks in the hack fight. They don't care here, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they don't care. They gotta have action. No action. To right. the we need we need a fight, right? <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> It'd be, it'd be, uh, priorities <laughs> but uh so in terms of the stag uh, derbies right usually it, before it used to be like october so there'd be an off season right stag derbies would start in october and then they created more events to, to start you know earlier like september and now mm-hmm. they have something called the early bird where you hatch your stags really early like in uh you gotta hatch them i think september october so that you start mm-hmm. competing late july with stags and wow. these derbies are huge. I mean, a lot of people are into it. They say uh, it's easier to raise the chickens at this time. And the stags grow healthier. So pretty much uh, July, 
12 years uh 12 months a year there's uh big derbies yeah so that basically go back to what you're saying, how y'all guys are tweaking your breeding program to kind of fit your style. So now you got guys doing more breeding now, trying to do more breeding. You said in yeah. what, September? Yeah, to, to try to make it for that next year, of the that next stag season, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of different. I, I haven't participated yet in this, uh, they call it the early bird derbies, because okay. uh, you, you're kind of like forced to breed what what's... Uh, available right you can't breed what you want to breed right like mm -hmm. you just guys oh this one's not malting this hand's laying i'll just put him together hope for the best and uh right. you know it's a kind of like a weird concept to me right it's like you're tailoring right. your system your breeding program for for the derby promoters right yep. uh, so i don't know it's kind of hard but like eventually i'm gonna have to start producing uh chickens for those events yeah Right, and now that's that was going to be my next question. So tell me this: Would you going to watch him? How, how had the stags? You know, how, what do you think about your the performance with these new early bird derbies? What do you think about the stags? Um, you know, I I prefer to fight cocks. I believe, you know, you got to give your chickens time, and a lot of these birds are kind of uh, rushed into fighting. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. say there are a lot of birds that fight that they're not mentally uh, ready for the stress of of pointing the chicken and uh you'll see there are a lot the quality of the stag fights it's uh not as uh, huh? not as consistent but what's consistent is the action and like a lot right. of entries a lot of people joining and of course right. there are uh, farms that will specialize in the stag derbies right People wow. who spe specialize in it, and like, are there people who breed only for stag derby? They'll fight only stags, and then after they'll just sell, sell the chickens to other fighters for cock season, and they concentrate on stag derby. Uh, wow. The prize money so is bigger a... in the stag derby. It is, huh? Yes, it's bigger. More people join. Uh, I guess the cost of raising the bird is is uh is more affordable, right? Because when you go out right. here to like the big cock derbies, people are going to show three, four year old, like the big, okay. big guys, the tough guys. They're going to show like really aged roosters. And um, tendency here in the Philippines is they believe that an aged rooster has a big advantage over, say, a two year old. So, what's your opinion? Like, what what you think is the best time to show in a long run? Like, what age? It'll depend on your bloodline. It depends okay. on the bloodline. Uh, for me, I, I like my birds at two years old. A majority of them, two years old is good. And I, I tend to do well uh, in the stag derbies, the later stage. I like my birds mm -hmm. need a bit, for me, they bit uh, they need a bit more time to mature, especially depending on uh, what cross, right? But right. Uh, like, I, like I said earlier, like you'll have like certain pens that you mm -hmm. uh, have them designed specifically for the stag derby. Right. Wow. And like you have, so I have, have other pens. Like I'll just hatch them. I won't even bother training them as, as stags. Wow. So so y'all guys had kind of started to, to tweak your program a little bit to kind of start to build a little a little selection of stags that maybe compete next year or something like that. Um. Yeah. Of course. I I always compete in the stag derby, the the regular ones, the ones that are hatched. Um, the main, the main bulk of the stag derbies here is for birds hatched from December to January. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the main breeding season in the Philippines. Is, uh, December and Jan January? December, December and January. Uh, well, I, I believe in the States, they start much later, right? In the spring. Right. right? Here, if you right. hatch them, you hatch them late March, April, you'll have a hard time raising them because of the heat, the changes in the wild changes in the climate, the weather, right? It's gonna be really hot. Then it'll rain real hard for like ten minutes, and that that's right. that's rough on the on the chicks, right? It's very hard right. to raise uh, chicks in March, April here. So okay. we we need we need to hatch a bulk of our birds in December and January. Okay, the bulk of them de de December yeah. and January. And you said you pretty much what from your experience and your bloodlines that you have, you like to show them at two years old. It's about the about the the ideal time for y'all guys and y'all bloodline. Yeah. yeah, but uh, we, we also uh, can't avoid not showing the stag derby. You have to participate too. So, because uh, you need to maintain your like uh, 
status as a member in the breeders organization. Like each province has their own uh, right. breeders organization. Okay. And in okay. order to, so y'all, y'all, to keep y'all getting the bands, like yeah, right, you have to at least join one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so tell me this. So, um, you know, now we kind of got a, a good understanding of your bloodlines, you know, kind of what you breed. Let's start talking a little bit of details as far as like your chicks and we're going to take it from there. Like, do you use incubators, natural hatch? How do y'all guys do with your chicks? Oh, we, we use a uh, incubator. Okay. Incubator, a hundred percent incubator. It's important here to try and hatch a lot of chicks at the same time. Especially if you're going to compete in the Stag Derby. Because selection and age will make a big difference in like these Mm -hmm. big big tournaments, right? If you have a lot of birds that are the same age, you'll have a a good advantage. It's not like you'll have, uh, you know, 10 this age, then your next batch are going to be younger. You'll be at a disadvantage. So, yeah, as much as possible, you want to hatch a few batches of many chicks. Right. And uh, right. this next season is going to be interesting, especially in our part of the Philippines, because the volcano uh, kind of disrupted a lot of breeding programs. So everyone's uh, kind of behind. There's a right. uh, big volcanic eruption in January. Right. And a lot of uh, chicken breeders in that, uh, in that area were affected by the volcano. And then now we got this uh, virus. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting year next year to see how people uh produce their their chickens right see how everybody was affected each farm because i'm pretty sure everybody yeah. was definitely affected it ain't gonna be so i guess you everybody's just gonna be scrambling trying to make the best out of what they have or what they have left yeah yeah but you, you you'll be surprised people are gonna have a lot too man they spare no expense to take care of their chickens <laughs> Shit. you know the saying in the philippines is if the house is on fire the, the man of the house will save the chicken then go back for his wife and kids that's, that's is that deep in the culture, huh? That's what they, they wrote about the Filipinos way back in the 1900s. The Spanish were in charge here, and when the Americans came, there's it's like a national obsession, chicken fighting here. Wow. Wow. So tell me this. So let's, let's walk us through. If you can walk us through y'all guys' chick program, that'd be great. You know, because, again, it's a whole different climate and stuff like that. You said y'all guys only use incubators, oh, yeah. right? You know, to, yeah. to, to put out as many chicks as you can at the same age. So, you know, walk us through the process of y'all guys' hatching program. Okay. So, yeah, we got the, the incubator. I got a new incubator, actually, one with a 800 egg capacity. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to up my production, as I said earlier, like to produce more in a shorter amount of time. But uh, mm-hmm. typically, I'll hatch the eggs uh, December, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll take them out. We'll put them in the brooders. For about three weeks, mm-hmm. they stay in the brooders. Uh, of course, a vaccination is a big part of the of raising Program. chicks in the Philippines. Yeah, there's a lot of diseases here, uh, and there's so many uh, uh, game fowl and uh, uh, livestock breeders that okay. you have to keep up with. The you know you might you might be in close proximity to another farm, so if they get sick, you're gonna get it. It spreads really quickly. So you gotta cover gotcha. all your bases, right? Uh, gotcha. I give about I give about eight different uh, vaccines, and that's that's not even uh, a large vaccination program. Some give a lot, right? Wow! I'm fortunate I can raise my chicks in an area where there are not as many uh, game fowl breeders, at, at least uh, where the chicks grow up. So you but you like, vaccinate for about eight different things, huh? Yeah. Yeah, um, but the main the main uh, thing you'd have to watch out for in the Philippines: Newcastle disease, uh, probably uh, coryza, especially now in the weather now. And uh, they got all sorts of uh, like they don't even know what these things are in the U.S. These different diseases that we wow. vaccinate for. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. So, so tell me this. So, I'm, a, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. How long do you keep your chicks in a brooder? Three weeks. Okay, what you feed them? Uh, the chick crumble. It's like a, they got products here especially designed for, for chicks. So, I guess okay. it's like a crumbled pellet. Yeah. Okay. And then they just get it, clean. Go ahead. Is it medicated or unmedicated? 
Uh, unmedicated. 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 Yeah, okay. we give the medication in the water. Okay, that's going to be my next question. What do you yeah. put in there, water? Uh, just like a multivitamin. Sometimes you can even uh, just put like some honey for the young chicks. We put honey in the water. They like that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. How but, many uh, days a week would you put honey in the water? Uh, we were doing it a lot like first three days. But then uh, sometimes we put it, sometimes we don't kind of now. You know, it's like, oh, right. let's do this. Put that. It's not really like a set in stone kind of thing, right? Right. But that's kind of like right. a, one thing we we do from time to time. But uh, Just add the honey. Add the honey in the water, yeah. And uh, what else? You give medicine, uh, electrolytes for the chicks. Okay. Okay. And multivitamin. I guess uh, there's a change in the weather. You might give a preventive uh, antibiotic to them. Water soluble. And okay. when they're a bit older, you're going to warm them too, right? You to warm right. chicks. So tell me this, Antonio. So after the three-week process, is there any any particular thing that y'all guys do before y'all take them out of those brooders? Like as far as any type well, of you know, extra antibiotics? Or is there any particular thing that y'all guys always no. do before they leave the brooders? No, not, not, not really. We okay. just put them. We got some pens outside. And first, they're going to stay in the pens. Mm-hmm. About two, three days, get accustomed to the weather. Like my chicks, they grow up in a place with a, a lot of wind, right? That's why I keep them in three weeks. If I was in another place, I'd be bringing them out earlier. But there's a uh, strong wind. I, uh, it's a colder climate where I am from most of uh, the Philippines, especially during uh, January, February. Very, it can get pretty windy and stuff. So they, they'll right. stay in these pens. They, I guess the size of a brood pen. And they get accustomed to being on the ground two, three days. Then we open the door. They can sleep inside the pen. And they go out and they, mm-hmm. they range. We call it range in the Philippines. Free range. Right. Yeah. Right. I guess in, the, in America, right. they'll call it like uh, country walk or something like that, right? Yeah, country walk. Well, well, free range too. Yeah. Kind of like free, free range. range they yeah. run out. So, yeah. Right. So like we call it, well, we range the chicks. And then they'll stay there. Uh, yeah, till we start harvesting them. I got two. Uh, I got separate areas because I don't want to mix the younger batch with the older batch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the younger batch will either be bullied by the older batch or they could get uh, they could get disease from the droppings of the the older batch, older right? Ones. Yeah, got you. So got you kind of want to raise um, the different batches in different spots, right? And got then you. as as they get older, I got a range uh, in like. Uh, Kind of like a ravine or something, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like yeah, the downward slope. Mm. Yeah, downward and, slope. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, kind of like uh, heavily uh, forested. So th- I, I just put them there until they right. start showing fight. Then we'll grab them uh, and we'll and put them in the hardening them. hardening pen. Yeah, all that's right. The next process. Now tell me this. Let's back up just a little bit. So when you put them outside, you put them in a size, you know, put them in a place where the, the place is kind of like a brewer for, you know, two, three days, leave them in there. Then y'all guys start to let them free range from that point, but they still yeah. return to the brooder type thing outside. What type, yeah. are you still feeding them the crumbles? Like what kind of feed? Are you still feeding them the crumbles? Yeah, we'll start introducing uh, the grain. The, okay. The same grain I give uh, the fighting cocks, but we grind okay. it. And so, okay, and of course, uh, with the, how it is in the Philippines, like these companies, they'll have feed specifically for the age group. Right. So the crumble is only for when they're chick. Once they're about like two, three months, they have another feed specifically for that. Got you. So y'all guys so like just we'll kind of, y'all have a lot of options over there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, too many options. <laughs> too many. Right. You might get confused. Right. So it's a, <laughs> well, I guess it takes a lot of guessing out of it. You know, they say, hey, this right here is for, you know, two months to five, you know, two months to four months. So I guess it takes a lot of take a lot of guessing out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, in terms of raising, uh, it'll be easy for a beginner to get involved. There's a, a lot of help and a lot of... Uh, uh, how should I say, uh, information available, readily available to someone who'd want to get into raising chickens. And there's a lot of easily uh, 
uh, products that are easy to acquire. So, right. yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So you got them out there, you know, a uh, uh, couple months old. They're, they're out there free ranging, you know, at a couple months old. Then you said, you know, obviously once they start trying to fight each other, y'all put them in a hardening pen. What do y'all guys call a hardening pen? Like what size is it and all that? Oh, uh, it can vary. I got two, right? Uh, I got like a four by four square mm-hmm. pen. And I have mm-hmm. one that's more like a fly pen. I'd say it's like a four by eight, right? Okay. It's okay. More like a little fly pen. Uh, four by How six. How tall is four it? By, um, I'd say six feet, that one. The other pen, the four by four, it's short. It's like. Okay. You know, okay. Typical, and how like, high is like what you see in the in the states, the, that size. In the states, same. right? Yeah. The size. Okay. Then I got a, so, a little, some a little taller, like a little fly pen. Yeah. Okay, like a little smaller, probably like a five feet taller or something like that. Five or six feet yeah, tall. Yeah, five to six feet. Yeah. Five to six feet. How high is the roost pole in that one? No, not too high. About chest high. You don't want it too high for the stags. Okay. But like when I okay. condition uh, chickens, I got I got one set of fly pens. With a seven foot pole, so they fly high, okay. and then I can adjust it. I can bring it down lower. Right, right, right. And and I'm asking you all these detailed questions because I just want to try to make sure we provide as much as inf- detailed information as possible. You know, because yeah. everybody's at different types of levels. That's 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 going to be viewing the uh, interview. So um, you put them in them hardening pins. Oh, oh, how long do they typically stay in the hardening pins? Uh, for me, as long as possible. I'd like them. Okay. I'd actually like to leave them out on range as long as possible, but okay. um, with the schedule of the stag, the stag derbies, you got to dub them. Uh, I'd say you got to keep them about three weeks at least in the okay. hardening pen. That, that's not okay. even quite enough, really. But uh, as much as possible, I, I don't like to tie them too early. The, you know, the legs are still soft. But, right. But if you don't tie them, they'll be too wild to train. You know, so it's all, I say you got to make a judgment call on like each bird. You got to see like, oh, how's he progressing? You know, some can be tied out earlier than others. You just got to take it like that, right? Right, right, right. So your idea, and like you say, I guess I was going to ask you, you know, once they come out the fly, I mean, the heart and pins, but you kind of already explained that, that, uh, that, that question. Um, I do want to ask you one comment, uh, that have a, is a question in a comment that, um, Ask. It says something about, you know, um, it says ask him about bacteria flushing, how it works, and why y'all guys do it. Oh, okay. Well, uh, usually, like, when you bring him in, you give him uh, something like a sulmet to, like, flush the, flush the intestines and the inner in, insides of the chicken. Uh, okay. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, definitely, we do that. Once we get, get them off the range, that's one of the first steps we're going to do. Right. The bacteria okay, flush so before they go in that hardening pen, y'all guys do that bacteria flush. Oh, while they're in the hardening pen, right? We'll deworm okay. them, give them some B12. We'll uh, we'll uh, shower, um, shampoo them, the mites, you know, wash them, mm-hmm. and then yeah, we give the bacterial flushing. Okay, so now that you said all of those things, let's walk through each of them. So, what do y'all guys use for the bacteria flushing? Is there a product only available in the Philippines? Uh, yeah, a sulmet. But that, I think that's from the states, right? Okay. There's there's also a Philippine version of it. Okay. Um, not not too familiar with the name right now, mm-hmm. but it's definitely it's the same thing as Sulmet. So, so, so same thing. Okay. Yeah. And what do y'all guys use to bathe them in for the mites? Oh, there are many different uh, shampoos here, local local brand. So uh, we just rotate amongst the different brands. Okay. Of uh, shampoo, just different brands. Uh, many. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then, so you said you do the flushing, um, bacteria flushing, you do the, uh, shampooing for the mites and stuff like that. What type of wormer do you like to use? Oh, you got to rotate the wormer. You can't give the same one all the time. Right. Right. We prefer so the, the, what, the local wormers here. They're much stronger than the U S wormers. Right. Right. Well, yeah. Well, a lot of people in the States try to get the wormer that y'all guys have because we definitely yeah. know it's definitely stronger, definitely My stronger. Old. Big difference, big difference. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a big. There's the the green one called Battlecock. There's Hammer, a uh, lot of lot of the wormers. I a lot of the rotate through the major brands, so you know. 
okay. Okay. Yeah, they might kind of get, I don't know do if it's worm? true, but they might get immune or whatever. Right, yeah. right. So tell me this, how often do you worm? Oh, you got to be on top of that, really. Especially uh, for the fighting cocks. Mm-hmm. At least uh, once a month for the ones that are going to fight. Okay. And uh, as much as possible, I'd like to worm uh, once a month. Uh, mm-hmm. But first, you got to worm him twice. We're going to worm him and then we're going to follow up 11 days later. Then after that, you can uh, worm once a month. But like, right. you know, if you got a lot of birds in the keep, you know, and then you don't end up using this one, then it all like, it's, you can't really synchronize everything, right? Right, but, right. You just gotta, gotta just for, keep track. Yeah, at least for the birds, like, what are just being aged and stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. once a month. Once a month. Okay. Yeah. So we got them in a hardening pen. So in a hardening pen, they done had their bacteria flush. They've been washed for the mites and that type of stuff. And uh, and they had their wormer. That's that's what happens when they come off the range and they start to go in a hardening pen. So those are the things that you do in a hardening pens, right? Yeah. Oh, you give them a hen so, too. Oh, you give them a hen. Yeah. And you can put uh, like a half a tie cord on the leg. So they get used to the uh, sensation of that uh, the strap on the leg. Oh, right? okay. Yeah. That's another little trick. Yeah. So, this also makes so, it easier to catch them because they're still kind of wild in the, in the hardening pen, right? Right, right, right. Exactly. So, so um, those are a couple good things. So now with the putting a hen, what's the concept behind putting a hen in there with them? Yeah, to build up their uh, courage, their confidence. Okay. You know, start to walk because if you take them off of the free range and you put them in the pen, they're going to be kind of freaked out, right? Okay. Especially like uh, w- my farm set up, right? Uh, the, they'll be right in front of the mature cocks, right? So that can mm-hmm. be kind of intimidating, right? They got intimidating. These, you know, the, right. the cocks, when they see new stags being put into those pens, they, they kind of like, you know, they want to get at them. Yeah, right? they want to get at them. And, and then so, like you uh, said, they, they be, get, it, yeah, so you got to put them in the hand. the stags. Right. Yeah, give him a hand, right. give him confidence and stuff. Yeah. Right. So it's like some some type of, uh, you know, uh, um, mental conditioning also too, to kind of calm them down, get them in there yeah. with a hen. And, and, and so they not just focus on that big old cock that's sitting right across from them, looking like he's banging that cord trying to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. um, and 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 you said I know you said a few minutes ago that, you know, y'all typically leave them in there three weeks, but you try to leave them there as long as possible because you want them to get, you know, you want their legs yeah. and stuff to get hard. Yeah, especially like later in the season, the ones I'm not going to use for the stag derby, I'll just leave them in. Okay. Yeah. They, they and fare you leave better. The, the hen in there the whole time? Or no, you no, just no. Put the... You can't leave the hen in there too long. Be okay. bad for both of them. Okay. Just, uh, you got to see. Like, if you leave a hen in there long, they'll start uh, dropping weight too. So you just got to monitor. Okay, because that was going to be my leave, next like, question. Two days, three days, then take them out, then. If you still think you might need more time with the hen, put the hen back in, you know. But it's hard to like leave them with the hen, especially if they're, right. they're still if you're still uh, trying to develop the body on the chicken. Okay, so that was going to be my next question. So you said if you leave the hen in there too long, the they, their their body start to get weak on a stag. Uh, well, like they get spent, right? They'll be it's like they'll be always working. They'll always be chasing the hen, jumping up and down, you, you know. So. Mm-hmm basically like uh, too much movement for that stage in its life mm, mm, okay okay so you're concentrating probably... on, on putting putting some meat on him some yeah? weight on right and developing yeah. their body and, and i know some of these questions are common sense to you but i'm pretty sure there's a lot of people watching that is not common sense that's why i'm kind of asking you know a lot of details about every step that y'all guys are doing um, yeah no worries so, so you have the pen in there. You put the pen in there. You said just a couple of days or something like that to kind of get the uh, stag acclimated to being in the pen. Um, and yeah. you try to take them on out. Um, yeah. And typically, you can take them on out and the stag will be okay. Um, yeah. You don't really need the, the hen in there too long because the stag will be doing just way too much moving, too much activity. And that's a stressful yeah. time for them at that stage in life, right? Yeah, correct. All right. So we got the stags in there. They're doing good. Um, you know. What is typically the time that you'll go ahead and move them on now? Obviously, y'all guys got them on a, a tie cord. So, you know, what 
when do you go ahead and bring, typically try to bring them on out of that, you know, out of that hardening pen and try to get them on a tie core? Around what age are they? Oh, age seven months, eight okay. months. Because okay. they're going to fight at about nine months, nine, ten months. That's the age they're going to fight. Okay. Ten months so ideal, but mostly like you might have to fight nine months. Yeah. So tell Those me this, guys. Antonio. Tell me this. So back in the day, you know, say like in the 80s and stuff like that, you know, and I'm asking this question because I know Spanish fouls turn on really early, really, really early. And I know, you know, a lot of American foul don't turn on that early. You know, yeah. back in the 80s, were, 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 were stags turning on that early, you know, eight, nine months, and stuff like that, ready to oh. ready to fight? Uh, definitely not. I was still a kid in the 80s, though. But uh, the there wasn't the stag derby fighting wasn't as uh, popular as it is now. Oh, now you see people sparring five month old stags. Right. At least they say they're five months. I don't know. I, I personally, I've never sparred a five month old chicken, but you could see it on on Facebook. They're claiming right. like five months old first spar, right? But uh, right. You know, for me, I think they'll, they'll just start fighting about six months, seven months, right? And then, yeah. Right. Different, different training stags. Wow, wow. Different training stags. Okay, all right. So, so you kind of think they did kind of have to tweak the program, or they didn't oh, really have to tweak the program. The birds are all definitely, definitely. <laughs> and I've I've uh, seen like uh, if you if you breed uh, roosters that have won as stags, it kind of passes on mm -hmm. the trait. It'll pass on if you're using. It will pass root. on, huh? Yeah. If you use stag winners, the the sons will be good as stags too. Wow, the sons will be good as stags too. Okay, so tell me this: uh, you said that the stags had to be dubbed, right, to compete? Yeah, yeah. So you trimming them around what age? Eight, nine months, or mm, maybe seven, eight. Around seven. Sometimes huh? you're trimming them earlier than you'd want to, because you have to. Uh, reach your schedule for the derbies, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, like for the again, like with the later hatch stags, I'll I'll tr have them trimmed as bull stag already. Wow. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, is there any particular thing that you use to determine, you know, the stag? And is it the moon, or is it time of the year, or is it day of the oh, month, when to, or anything when to like dub? that? When to dump? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. China, like you look at that. Farmer's Almanac, right? Try and find those dates. They're usually correct. They are but, usually uh, correct. But, you know, sometimes you can't, you know, it's when, when you can do it and whatever. And especially that's like you want, this is during the rainy season, so you want to look for kind of like a window where it's sunny out. You don't want it like raining on the newly dubbed stags and stuff. So gotcha. that's, that's a major factor too, the weather. More, more right. than, but like as much as possible, we were like uh, taught to follow that that date in the almanac. You know, that's like an old right. old, old school cocker thing, right? Right. But I I don't know if they still uh, expose that here, but uh, okay. I don't know. I we were taught like that to do that. Yeah. So right. we try. Right, right, and that's why I ask. That's that's exactly why I ask because you know um, I know some people follow it, some people don't. So just wanted to try to get an idea. Um, if y'all guys do, so you said you, you y'all got guys still try to follow the almanac, but y'all also make sure that it's going to be some nice sunny days and not dub them when it's going to be any type of rain or anything like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so by the time they go out on them tie cords, they already dubbed, huh? The majority, yeah. The majority of them are dubbed. Um, yeah. Tell me this. So, you know, I, we talked about, you know, everything in, in, in the heart and pins. How about their feed and water? You put anything in their water. What type of feed you feed them when they're in the heart yeah, and pins? Just um, start to give more grain already in terms of the feed. Mm -hmm. It'll be mm -hmm. almost basically what will feed them through the keep. And uh, okay. Okay. water is just the same. Just clean water, fresh water. Just clean, just Not, clean no fresh more, water. No more medication, no more... Uh, Electrolyte, not much, at least. At least, uh, right. if not necessary, we won't give. Okay, okay, okay. So now they're out there on the tie cords, right? Um, and you said you typically like to show them as cocks at two years old. 
uh, based on the bloodlines that y'all guys have, y'all had pretty good luck with them being two years old, showing them there. Um, you know, yeah, we do. Before we, we do good stock derby too. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Well, what do you, so, you want to say? Or what do you want me to say? No, so about, I was going. I was going to go back to the stag. You know, which, which y'all guys, you know, obviously competing you, also in the stag derby. How do y'all guys like to do things with the stag, knowing y'all going to be be competing with them? Uh, you want to get them sparring, right? Right. So there's a lot more sparring with the stag. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the more uh, more sparring early in the keep, just to see, you know, teach them what to do. Kind of, they got to learn for. Uh, and uh, put them in the lights. You got to put them in the right. lights here. Uh, walk under okay. the lights. Because okay. uh, a lot of the fight is decided in the actual initial of approach, right? You need them to be uh, very aware of the situation in the, in the pit. And, right. Uh, but then, because they're stags, you can't work them too hard. You can't spar them too much either, right? So kind of like once you see their potential, you got to give them a like, lighter work you know just rotation scratch mm -hmm. box uh, more on a mental the mental is more important okay, you don't want it, you don't more. want like a very high strung stag you know, very hard to fight okay you don't want a high strung stag huh in general no but if they're very good you'll make an exception right but in general you want uh calm uh, confident yeah right so will, so walk a Th those are the ones. So tell me this, you know, you say you, you don't want to spar them too much. You know, what is the average or what do you like to do as far as when sparring? Is it a couple buckles and that's it? You know? Oh, yeah. Eventually, I'd want to just spar real quick. One, two, one, two. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And only one repetition. I don't like a lot. I like to do then the running back again. I, I don't right. like to run him back anymore. Just just once. Just once. Yeah. Okay. Is there any particular reason you like to do it just once? Have you ever did it more than once and kind of fell back to saying, "No, nah, I think one is good enough." Mm, well, I, I kind of get him hitting. Kind of, I want him to hit real hard. So, like, I don't want right. to have to spar him again, right? If right. I got to spar him again, they're probably not ready to fight. Right. 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 I, I want to get him right. hitting hard. And, hitting uh, hard. They got to know that they're only going to be pitted once. We don't handle here, right? Once he right. let it go, it's up to them. The ref is the one who's right. going to come in, and right. uh, you, you know you you don't want the fight to last long here. It's the roosters are are very deadly. The knife is really right. deadly. So exactly. when you have your opportunity, you got to take it and you got to finish. You got to take guy. it. You got to jump in there straight out, wide open, and get it if you can get it, huh? You, you need like a rooster here that is uh, cautious at the start. That's what uh -huh. I look for. I want one what's good in the first buckle. But once he he gets into that other bird, I want him to finish. Right. Sometimes if you go right. like too stylish, too stylish, he might right. get caught. Right? He might get caught. And if he, you only get caught once he, here, you're you're done. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Right. You only get you only get one chance there. So tell me this. Uh, you know when you when you spar the stags, right? Uh, do you use different roosters to spar with them? Because I heard you say that you know you kind of teaching them different things. So do yeah, you use yeah. different you, okay. different colors? You got you got to spar them against a lot of colors because here there's every color under the sun. They got it here, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of years. The the domes, the bullock fowl, very popular. Mm -hmm. White mm -hmm. fowl, henny, uh, gug golden pumpkin like all the weird mm -hmm. colors they're 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 what's in fashion now like wow if you would say uh 15 years ago 20 years ago it was all sweaters here now right it's not sweaters it's more on like off color fall and they're designed wow. for the stag derby they they they're there they look odd they want to draw you in and they'll get you first and you it's a testament to like the filipino breeders when these fowl first came around these we weird looking fowl sure they'll get you first but you hit them back once they're gonna fall apart but now no right more. like the first few seasons you don't oh maybe he'll hit you first but you'll kill him you'll kill him if he doesn't kill you in the first buckle you'll kill him now no more the right. the off-color fowl or the livability is just as uh, uh it's Hard equal to the, rest. The, the the reds and the grays yeah so they just they became they're, more durable, huh? Yeah, they they they've been able to do that. 
with the with the fall here. So, so I guess that goes back to like you saying, you know, throughout the years, you got to constantly stay away, stay ahead of the curve. So, the the off color foul came in the door very fragile, fast but fragile. You know, if they get you yes. first, they got it. But then if you hit them, they they done. You know, they can't take it. They can give it, but they can't yeah. take it. But now you're saying they can give it and they still can take some. Oh shit! And give back even more. <laughs> it's, a diff- <laughs> it's a different game here. <laughs> Wow! So Antonio, look tell at me, chickens man. that look like they look like nothing, and then they'll whip you, and they'll be like, "Oh, what the hell happened there?" <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> wow! Well, well, t- well, tell me this, Antonio. I mean, that that's very interesting to hear. You know, um, that's very interesting to hear. So, so when did you kind of start to notice the change? Was it you know over the like the last three or two or three years, or three or four years, you started to see these off-color fouls become more durable? A bit longer than that. A little but longer than that? Especially now, yeah. Uh, let's, I don't know, when did they start? Uh, like mid-2000s, you started to see. first. The first ones that came were the Bullocks. Okay. The, the Godomes. And okay. they were the first, like, off-callers to arrive. Then people would bring in whites. And then the Hennies were a big thing. Like, like two, three years ago, Hennies were, were all... Uh, they're banning hennies now. Most derbies, big derbies, they won't accept hennies. Okay, tell us why. Because uh, uh, people complain, like, oh, I lost to a henny because they, they got a big advantage. Especially in stag derby, I think no organization allows hennies in a stag derby. Okay, I may tell be us wrong, why. but I think I'm right. Oh, because the advantage in the first, the first buckle is very okay. big. Yeah. And so there are a lot of cockpits that won't allow hennies in uh, derbies, in major derbies at least. I think right. only the pitmaster is the only major derby. Uh, maybe Arau ng Davao, maybe they allow hennies. But I know the World oh. Slasher Cup does not allow hennies, and uh, certain cockpits in Metro Manila, no, no hennies okay. in derbies. Okay, okay, for stag derbies, right? Even cock. I think oh, sta- even cock- it's stag derbies nationwide. No hennies in derbies. Okay, okay. Unless but it's it, a specific it- derby. Sometimes they have specific derbies, like you know, like a theme. Like you only fight uh, no reds and greys allowed. Like they have derbies like that here. Got you, got you. Imagine got there's you. enough off-colored foul to have a derby like that. Wow. I'd say now in the Philippines, there's more domes than there are greys. More common. It, it ain't got to that point, huh? Yeah, definitely. I can say that confidently, that there's more more domes than grays. Wow. And you said they have gotten a lot tougher and a lot more durable than they did when they first entered the island. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Is it All any chickens. particular Is it any particular breeders over there kind of like, like you said, some farms specialize in stags? You know, for those stag derbies, is there any particular, is there farms out there that specialize in them off-color uh, foul? Um, I think, you know, most breeders here, they kind of will have, like, everything on their farm. Okay. Okay. Because, yeah, yeah they, that's, the, that's the attitude here. Like, people like to uh, criticize us Filipinos for having, like, keeping too many bloodlines. Mm-hmm. But I guess uh, many of these people, they have the resources to be able to. Right. So, like, they, they right. want it all. Like, they got reds, they got blues, they got blacks, they got dome, they got everything. Because they want to say, like, I, I have to be prepared for everything, or I want to have the latest the latest bird that's in fashion, right? Right. Something like or, that. Or they probably want to compete in whatever derby comes up. They'll have something on a farm that can, that can compete in that derby, regardless of it's an off-color derby, a regular derby, or whatever. Yeah, that too. That too, yeah. Wow. So, so we're going to go back to the health thing a little, to, to the stag. So we talked about, you know, the sparring, you say, pretty much you only like to do like one buckle, right? Yeah. You don't like to go up, go, go twice. Um, and you say you use, you know, different, different birds to teach the stag different things. You know, yeah. say, you know, how many times would you say you would spar or how many different birds would you spar a stag with to make you comfortable enough to use them? Depends per stag. Each stag okay. will learn differently. Okay. Some stags, they won't even learn. Like, you just have to just check him out next year. Some learn real quick. 
right? Okay. And you just got to breed towards those, right? The right. The ones with, with a mature, quicker, you know. Right. Got you. Got, and you I'll said y'all guys do it. Once a week. And oh, then about once, once a I week. Know, okay. And then once I know who's good, we'll taper it off. Cause I, especially my, my, my dad, he's particular about like not sparring them close to the fight. Okay. Okay, so that was like, going to be my next they question. They want to like go like 10, 10 days or to a week out, no sparring. No sparring. And, and well, when you there, do there sparring, are other, just... other people who are also successful. They, they spar up to like maybe three, four days before. So it's like to each his own, right? There are many right. different ways to be successful in chicken fight. Right. But this is right. the method that, uh, that works for us at least. Right. You got to tailor right. it all to what you have, right? Your chickens. You got to find mm -hmm. uh, a key. Like you, you, can, you can, of course, you can listen to a lot of people, right? And say, hey, what do you do? But just because he's successful with what he does, doesn't mean mm -hmm. you'll be able to apply everything he says, mm -hmm. right? You'll have to like get bits and pieces from different people, see what fits your program and what fits uh, like your, your bloodlines. You have, mm -hmm. to know your, you have to know your bloodlines, like what they, right. they respond to, when to fight them. How, how to fight them, kind of, yeah. Right. So, like, you know, like, breeding and the training, they go hand in hand, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll understand the other aspect more, right? You'll be, you'll be able to breed better if you train your fowl. And uh, by understanding uh, your bloodlines, you'll also be able to come up with a keep that works for you, right? Right. Right, right. And Especially that, if you're, if you're going to do everything like yourself, right, breed and fight. There are a lot of groups out here that they'll just produce. Their, their job is just to breed. And then it'll okay. go to another camp who will just do the training, right? There's that too, people who like specialize and stuff. But if you kind of want right. to do it all in-house, you know, you got to learn how to do both. And through right. trial and error and experience, you know, you build a program. Right. Right. So tell me this. Can you tell us a little bit about your feed? I know you said it's like mainly grain, but is it, you know, can you tell us a little bit more detail? You know, what's the protein well, uh, percentage and stuff? Well, it's like uh, you give a protein pellet, like 16 percent protein. Mm -hmm. Then there's a mm -hmm. grain mixture, right? Like a concentrate. We call it a concentrate. I guess it's like uh, uh, what you got there, like um, Gamecock mix or pigeon, okay. racing pigeon mm -hmm. mix. So mm -hmm. it'll have uh, corn, it'll have wheat, it'll have peas, right? And so I'll give one part, uh, one part of the concentrate, one part of the protein pellet, and one part soaked uh, jockey oats. Okay, so you soaked so oats. do you feed the soaked jockey oats all year? Yeah, all year. I'll just pull them in the last week of the keep. But like okay. we we like to give the I I feel our chickens benefit from the soaked oats. And you give it to them all year, all year, all the way, all the you. the, the cocks and stags, yeah, right, all the cocks and stags. And, and I'm asking these, you know, I'm I'm really wanting to try to, like I say, get as much detail information as possible. So you said you go, um, you said the grain, a uh, a uh, uh, a third, a quarter, a quarter of the the pigeon feed. So how do you like one, one third, question. one third, one third, and then we feed one third, one third, one uh, shot glass. I don't Which know is what about that what? Is in ounces. We use grams here. So it's like 35 grams. About 35 feed. grams? Yeah, 30, 35, depending on what, so what the feed is. Like sometimes that's about the feed will be a bit lighter. Wow, that's about, yeah, okay. You said 35 grams. So that's a little over, yeah, the 35 grams. Okay, so that's a little over an ounce, huh? Well, you sure is it? You said 35 grams? No, maybe 30 grams. It's, it's a shot glass. Like a, what do you okay. get at a bar? That's exactly okay. what I feed twice a day. That's what I was going to ask you twice a day because I was sitting there thinking like, "Whoo, that's about half of what." Okay, so that sounds about no, right. That twice sounds a about day. right. You know, in Philippines, we have the resources to uh, employ people to help us on the farm, so mm -hmm. we can do uh, twice a day, right? I'm sure mm -hmm. in uh, America, a lot of people they gotta they have to work because they do it all themselves, right? It's very it's very right. difficult to. Here in the uh, Philippines, we're lucky also that we can we can get help like farm hands and right. it's a big help. You can do, right, uh, right, yeah. There's more uh, attention right. put on the chicken. The chickens are almost more. to the point that the chickens here are like babied. They get a gotcha. lot of attention. Yeah, a lot of attention. 
Wow. I mean, there's and someone on the big, chicken big 24, 24 7. There's someone on that chicken. Right? Wow. Wow. So so tell me this, because I know it's a couple of little comments in six. So we talked about the feed. We talked about the amount. You know, what time of the day do you feed uh, at the farm? Is it the exact same time pretty much or around the same time every single day? Around the same time. Around the same time. Mm-hmm. Let's say 7 a.m., 6 a.m. And then okay. uh, um, for the night, uh, depending on if, the, if we're fighting, we'll tend to feed earlier. Right. But five, five, six o'clock. In the afternoon. Okay. Okay. Uh, if the, okay. If there's a very early fight, maybe a feed at four, maybe. Uh, depends too, right? Uh, depends. But like in general, for the birds on on the on the string walks, the ones not in the keep, um, right? Morning, afternoon, right? By five o'clock, feed them. You want right. to feed them before the right. sun sets, so you have time to give them water. Okay. Okay. So, um, so we went through the feed. Y'all guys don't really add anything to the water when they just out, you know, when they're out on the on the string and all that. Y'all add anything to the water. Just make sure to get no. fresh or clean water. Um, you, we we talked about your feed. You feed two times a day. Um, so now as we're going along, you know, we talked about your breeding program. Um, so as we're going along, now we're talking about, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, going into the keep part of it. You know, how long is the average keep? You know, is the keep different from the cocks, from the stags, or is it kind of the same keep, same amount of time? Uh, let's say the main keep, about three weeks, I'd say. Okay. Three weeks. But, like, uh, you get a batch ready, right, of stags to enter the keep. It might take a little bit longer for the stags to be, for you to say, oh, these guys are ready to go into, like, a three-week three, three week program, right? Okay. And then once you... You know, you have stags from that keep that were unfought. You can put those back in a keep, like a two-week keep, and they'll respond, right? Got you. But uh, ideally, like, it's a three-week keep. Start of the season, right, it'll be a little longer because you're taking the fat off and stuff, and they're still out of the malt. So you might get long. And then, like, once you're rolling, like, I fight so often that it's not anymore, like, a specific keep. I can't say, like... I got these seven roosters pointed for this three cock derby on. Right. No, no. I got like 30 birds and we're like, oh, this guy can fight. This guy can fight this. Okay, we're going to use these guys. Yep, right? I understand. I it's understand. different. Right. It's different how it is uh, when the schedules. is very challenging. Uh, right. Like before, I used to fight more of just like uh, big derbies and you could really mm-hmm. like prepare, right? And you have it set. Right. And right. Uh, it's different. It's even harder now. Like even though the uh, they're not as big the derbies I'm in or whatever, mm-hmm. it's just I'm fighting so often, and right. I can be uh, I can't afford to be as uh, meticulous with the bird right or like as right. so strict with the selection, right? Mm-hmm. We just gotta go. Okay, he's good enough. We gotta fight him, kind of. Right. So you gotta have more. Prepa- you gotta be like ready to go at a given like a given notice. Given right? time. Like, given so y'all time. just constantly working instead constantly of before when birds, you're like constantly- yes. Yes, and then if you see one's like too tired, you just throw him out. Look at him next month, stuff like that. Just bringing birds in, bring him out. So different, gotcha. right? It's different. Right. Um, so, so, so tell me this: Do y'all guys feed in cups or y'all feed on the ground? Cups. Oh, y'all do cups. feed in cups. In I, particular I, especially reason. in the keep, all cup. All uh, cups. Yeah, I, I don't want it. like there might be like uh, if you keep feeding on the ground and they they miss. Uh, they miss some grains. They could get mold, and that's going to mess them up, right? Mm. So at least if it's in the cup, it's always uh, ideally in the cup. Sometimes if there's no time, like we're doing something else, like right. something with hands or dubbing right. or sparring, like, and there's no more time, you guys just got to throw right. it on the ground. But ideally always in a cup. And the birds in the keep will always eat in the cup. Okay. Okay. Now, do y'all guys just use regular plastic cups? Because I just seen some videos sometime. Y'all guys have some clay cups or rubber cups. Yeah. and the, the, the common, the, the traditional is the clay cup. Okay. That's like what, what most, but now now there's the kind of like, is it rubber? I'm not even sure it's rubber. It just looks like rubber. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what that material is. Rubber? Mm-hmm. Rubber rye? I don't know. 
but yeah, synthetic, right. <laughs> synthetic, synthetic. Yeah, like a poly, yeah. polybutylene, a yeah. utilene, yeah. something then like that. Yeah. Then also we get those, you know, those cups like in the states, what what hook on to the pens. We got those right. too. The plastic cup. The plastic cups. So you got, okay. oh, you got every product imaginable. They got it here. Every version. Right. You know, I know so, guys who so, feed in dog bowls for the dog. They, <laughs> <laughs> wow, they feed in anything, just as long as it's <laughs> off the ground, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, as long as it's off the ground. Well, when you got thousands of chickens, you got to feed them on the ground, right? But yeah, well, I that's all I was about I, to say. I got enough help, that, and I, I got enough chickens that we can get away with feeding them in the cup. Uh, time right. permitting, too, right? Right. So tell me this, is there any benefits with the clay cup? Or is it that's just something y'all always use? Um, yeah, it's just a tr- traditional thing. The clay cup is the most affordable, I guess. You got to always disinfect the cups with Clorox and stuff. Okay. And how often do y'all guys do that with the clay cups? Uh, should be once a month, but sometimes, you know, kind of, la- you know, you know, just inspect. Nothing's really right. set in stone, right? And say, oh, these look like they should be clean and stuff. Right. Right. Let Depends me, on let, the time let, of let, year, too. Mm-hmm. They'll get dirtier quick, you know. Right. Okay, let me ask you this. You know, what, 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 how do you feel about the water situation? You know, some guys, you know, depending on what size farm, everybody cannot wor- uh, 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 water, give them fresh water every single day. Uh, how do you feel about that? You know, we, talk, we had a guest on the other day, talked about, you know, they, they kind of seeing some evidence where algae and water had like an antibiotic benefit. We have some people oh. that put a little bleach in the water and different types of things. Yeah, bleach you in know, the water, yeah. Yeah, how how often do y'all guys change the water? Do y'all no. try to give them fresh water every single day? <laughs> yeah, more, more. They get fresh water like three times a day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Small. They get small in the clay cup. Walk around with a water bucket, and, and they, right. I got you know, but we have, of course we have we have helpers to do that. Right. right? So right. That's what I say. Like the the chickens are almost like babied. Mm-hmm. They get round the round the clock care. Care all yeah. the time. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's kind of walk into now. You know, we talked about the stags. We talked about the feed. You know, we talked about the, you know, how you guys like to spar. Um, uh, you know, do you use the same strategy that you, the sparring strategy with the cocks that you do with the stags? Because you said you kind of yeah. like the stag, just one buck, same concept. Pretty, pretty much, pretty much. Uh, my, my, I'd like to stay. My, my birds hit pretty hard. I don't want them busting each other up too much. Right. Right. Okay, yeah. I got you. So you basically do that one buckle because one, you want to make sure they get a mentally understanding yes. that as the soon as they drop to go out, they need to hit hard. Yeah, yeah. They got to learn the approach. They got to learn the approach, and uh, I also want to see them on the ground though. The the initial reaction on the ground. Okay. Now, so do once I see the y'all guys, if I'm satisfied with the. The first buckle and what we call the follow up. The follow up is good. Oh, right, he's good. He's a candidate. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you to follow. So you got the first buckle, and then you see if they're going if if the follow. Yeah, when maybe you say the we follow up. Two, th- uh, two buckles, three bu- three four buckles. That's and maximum that's four buckles. Right? Okay, just want to see how they react on the ground. How quick are they on the ground? Because the fight gotcha. still the ground is very important here. A lot of right. the birds won't go up anymore. It's not like they'll oh. run up to each other and, and, and break up. No, that's right. very rare here. Mostly they'll wait, right? And like when that first that trends first start happening, they'll wait, they'll approach slowly, and then they'll both come up. Now no more. One guy might stay down. A lot of a lot of times the first buckle, one will go over and they'll shuffle around and then they'll they'll hit into each other. So that that was going to be my See, next thing. Changing. So tell me it's this. It's always changing. Right. Right, right. Because I used to hear guys saying, oh, the, the thing went uphill, go up eight feet high, hit the lights in the pit and all that. You don't see too much of that no more, huh? No, no more. The chickens, you'll see them spar. They'll spar, they'll break real high. But once in the pit, no, it's a different ball game in the pit. Because once, you know, your roosters, you're sparring your roosters against your roosters, right? So they, they pretty right. much react the same. But once you right. put them against another rooster, he doesn't know that rooster. And that rooster may do some move he's never seen before. Oh, right. Uh, then, fuck, coin flip. Right? Gotcha. Gotcha. So so all that high flying, it ain't, ain't too much of that no more. So would you say the birds now being, you know, is it 
the birds becoming more intelligent now? You know, do y'all guys take that in consideration? Or movement? Is it movement, Athlet- intelligence? Athletic. They are definitely more athletic. They can change. Oh, they very, very athletic, the chickens now. Uh, intelligent, yeah. There's uh, That's with the breeder. Some guys like more aggressive. Some guys like more, uh, you know, uh, weaving and stuff. Right. But the, the main thing is uh, generally everyone has athletic chickens. They can okay. adjust, right? Turn quick and all that, huh? You want birds that can they can fight. They're prepared for any fight, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so what's the average size over there Like that y'all guys are breeding? What's the average size? Well, we, we use uh, kilograms, right? I might make a mistake uh, converting. Uh, but usually like two, two kilograms, two to two, two. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's a little I don't know. It's like pounds. four, four, it's four like pounders four. or five. I'm not too sure. Huh? About five. It's about five pounds. I think a kilogram is, yeah, it's about five pounds. Yeah. So you, you're you probably a little over five. So y'all birds are, uh, are in the fives, put it that way. They're okay, not yeah. six, they're in the fives. Yeah. Top weight here would be two, five. Okay. So that'd be and, like a six pounder. And bottom weight, one, eight. Okay. Okay. So that's, you, a, so that's a typical derby range here. One eight to two five. All right. So high four. Actually, they're bringing it down. Two, one eight to two four fifty. That's a trend now, mostly. Okay. Okay. All right. So I guess they kind of like the American uh, uh, average size of the Americas. The average size of America, I guess, is in the fives. I would say it's yeah. in the fives. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them, you know, five four, five two, stuff like that. But mainly, you know, they they they're gonna be in the fives. Um. So we talked about feed. So let's talk a little bit about too, and not to not to veer off the subject too much, because I still do want to talk about. Um, actually, we just kind of talked about that. I wanted to kind of talk about y'all guys' farm setup. Do y'all guys use a lot of? Uh, I know you said hardening pins. So y'all guys got tie cords, hardening pins, yeah, fly pins. Cross, y'all guys fly, use pen. fly pins. Yeah, fly pins. Uh, mostly we do fly pen, scratch box rotation. Not much table work anymore. Before, we used to do a lot of table work back in the day. But, you know, it's the game's changing, right? The schedules, the, the amount of derbies. There's right. no, no, so you got you to gotta uh, adjust to the times too, right? right? So it's mostly a rotation-based keep. Okay, rotation. And that, that, that's a kind of reflection of the times where, you know, you don't have really have enough time to be working 30, 40 birds on a table. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. So... So tell me this, Antonio. Do you see a difference in the birds that's conditioned now through rotation versus the, when y'all guys used to table work birds? Well, you know, in the Philippines, you don't really table work that much, but you do it just okay. to get them like used to being handled. You know, it's more okay. of a mental. The table, the table work helps them more mentally, right? Okay. Uh, there's no, right. there's no use really building up stamina for a long knife fight. That's if you're right. going, if you're going past. The, Three, four buckles, you're not cutting. You're, yeah, not, right. you're not doing right, right? You want it right. bang, bang, bang. Three, and that's it. Three contacts, that's it. it's that's done, it. right? You want to so, explode out the gate and, and then that's yeah. to be over with. Here, more, it's about getting your rooster sharp. That's, that's the, it's more on sharpness, right? Uh, but, of course, you, you want them strong, too, where they, they can carry carry their punch in a longer fight. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, so tell me this. So as we walking on down this thing, because I think we're doing a pretty good job covering a lot of details and stuff like that. Um, so tell me this uh, with, you know, like you said, getting them sharp. You know, you said you do about a three week keep, a 21 day keep, right? Uh, ideally, ideally. Yeah. Ideally, 21 day keep. And what kind of food are you feeding them during the keep? Food. Uh, same. Same ratio. Oh, same food. Yeah. Three okay. part. Yeah. Okay, so they the same yard feed. So they basically eat the yeah. same yard feed but throughout the keep. In, in the point, we'll pull the oats and, um, yes, we, we'll carbo load. Okay, and what do y'all use to carbo load? We have, a, like, a, a pellet for that. Oh, y'all do. Have y'all always had something for that, or? No, this is like, uh, we got a tip from a friend. Okay. Yeah, but uh, okay. if not, we'll use corn. Like, corn, I don't always have that. that or- Crack, crack corn, yeah. Okay. So, so that's the last. Kind of walk us through, you know, uh, 
what y'all guys well you are we already know pretty much you know you throughout the keep they're eating regular regular yard feed and all that kind of stuff well tell me this you know how how does it go to like the last three days you know you feed two times a day do you feed two times a day during the keep and how do you feed them last three days oh yeah we'll, we'll, we'll cut the feed right we'll go to half okay. feed quarter feed and then minimum minimal but like uh, um I like to haul the chickens empty, right? So okay. sometimes, because uh, we fight like three, four days in a row, okay. I'm going to haul birds uh, to, to the city earlier. So we'll get them empty earlier for, for the drive down. And uh, yeah. Okay. We'll, like, so go, go ahead. So tell me this. Say if, say if you was going to show on Friday. You know, how would, the, how would the concept, how would your system be if you're going to show on Friday? You know, how would your system be the last three days up until that Friday, even with your travel? Okay, so if I'm going to, I ideally, I, what I'm doing now mostly is we're hauling early Friday morning because okay. we're, we're going to fight uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Actually, mm -hmm. for the past couple of uh, months, it's only been a, uh, I haven't been fighting on Sundays, Friday, Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, how will we say this? Let's say, okay, let's say I'm just going to fight one event, right? Okay, okay. Uh, Friday. Ideally, I'd bring the birds to the pit Thursday. Okay. Right? But uh, I can't do that all the time. It depends where, right? Right. So, if I have to bring them the day of fight to the pit, uh, we'll start cutting the feed three days out. Let's say uh, I, I can't explain in uh, ounces or whatever, right? Or you don't have to be I don't just. Know. I, just I know it's in, a, it's in grams, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, we'll, usually it's 35 grams. So they eat. Then they'll go 20 or 15, depending on the bird. Some get away with feeding less, right? And then 10 grams, 5 grams last feed, day before the fight. Okay. And the night before. And, and every, then, and depending every, on. I, okay, go ahead. No, I was about to send everybody watching. Y'all guys can use a calculator and figure out his grams, you know, so he don't have to waste time trying to, you know, convert it over. Yeah. So just talking to grams and the kilos or whatever you want to do, we'll, we'll figure it out. So let's say we're going to haul him to the pit at like uh, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. I'd like to feed only five grams at about uh, four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. That's the day before. And a day before, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, at the pit, I can make up for it if they're feeling a bit uh, light, right? But that's okay. if I have a day, a day to go. You know what I mean? Okay. okay. Yeah. So no but, feed on the so, day of the show. Yeah, but typically, like Friday, we fight in the afternoon on Friday, mm -hmm. right? No, no feed uh, as much as possible. No feed, but in the big derbies, the ones that run late, you got to give feed. Okay. The derby goes all day. But uh, for okay. me, like in the Philippines, we have the benefit of uh, knowing the schedule of the whole derby. It comes out mm -hmm. in the morning. Mm -hmm. So like we'll calculate what, the what we think is necessary and we'll give the chicken just one feed. I only like to feed once. I don't like to follow up, especially uh, with my, my bloodlines. I feel okay. like if I, you know, like how they, they point feed or like take him out, give him the feed, I think they lose the edge. At least in my my experience with my my fall, I'm not claiming to be like the best or whatever. I'm no, right. I understand. But, like, you know, a, a lot of people will disagree. This is like a heated topic, right? And a lot of people are mm -hmm. firm in their their beliefs right. and stuff, right? right? But uh, I only, I believe like they perform best if if you're gonna have to feed them, you just feed them once. You calculate like if this is enough feed to last them to to that 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 fight schedule. That fight. So tell me this: Would this be fair to say? Like, do you like to have like a twelve-hour window? Like, if they're going to show at five in the afternoon, six in the afternoon, the last time you feed them that little five grams would be like mm. five in the morning, something like that, or is it any type of hour? No, no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's mostly more for like the derbies would go into the night where you have like if the fight starts in the afternoon. Typically, I'd like no feed in him. At okay. least my, my 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 birds like the hatches, the grays. They they will fight better with a with less feed. Okay. Right. But like if I had another bloodline, maybe they need the feed. Right. Right. Like I, I, right. Uh, Orientals, right. They need more feed. Okay. They need it more. You said Orientals. Yeah. 
I have some ACLs, Japs. Okay, okay. I, I bring some of those too. And uh, okay. hey, I gotta get a charger. Hold on. Oh, all right, I seen you. <laughs> Well, listen, guys, I hope y'all guys are enjoying, uh, as you know, these interviews go long. And I figured, uh, you know, that's what happened yesterday. I mean, uh, with uh, Chemo from Hawaii, his battery, his battery ran out. Yeah. Hold on. I got to get I'm running out of battery. We got a nice uh, conversation going. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Hello. OK. OK. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. You want all right, so and I know you can't put the earphones in because it's used the same jack, uh, yeah, the same okay, outlet. Okay. Um, ah, okay. All right. Okay, can oh. you hear me? Yeah. And Tony, you're a little muffled. I don't know if, if we, yeah. where the speaker's located at, it sounds a little muffled. Oh, he clicked out. Well, don't worry, guys. We'll bring him back in. He's just trying to get uh, he's just trying to get the uh, the phone situated. But no worries, uh, he'll be back. And y'all guys know how long these interviews go. You know, we try to get as much as information in there as possible for y'all guys. You know, while we have, while we have here, he's coming on in now. Um, give him one second. He'll come on in. All right. Yep, you coming in? Hold on one second. Yeah. All right. So you you back? Yeah, I gotta hold the phone. I had it in like a cup, and yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, you said that, uh, hold on. I just want to make sure the guys got, I think they said you didn't have any audio. Let me see. I think you should have audio. Hello? Audio, you audio. Hear me? That might have been an old, that might have been. Oh, it must have been when the phone was in the cup. Right. Because I can hear you. All right. So yeah, it's like, all right. It's like a situational thing, right? You just gotta know your roosters, and like what method they they'll um, respond to. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so the feed and the feed thing, the last feed, kind of like you say, depends on the type of rooster you have. If you know your rooster, you say yes, with your Orientals. Yes. That's okay. true. That's true. I'll feed almost uh, double if it's uh, like an Oriental. Uh, I have uh, piles. Well, the piles okay. across the Oriental anyway. So that's okay. about the same thing. I got some with the round head blood, mm, round heads. I got I have a few round heads. Uh, no, they could they kind of will respond the same as Western chickens, uh, but they uh, will. It's more on the Orientals. Okay. Does the Orientals pass their feed quicker? Yeah, they pass their feed quicker, much quicker. Okay. Okay, because I always heard that, and I kind of learned it from experience. But I wanted to ask you your opinion on it. So you say it do pass much much quicker. So there's really no set in stone time of when you will get that last feed, as far as like you said, the hour. Time? So well, uh, no. Say if okay, go ahead. Yeah, like no. So basically, say if they was going to show say Friday afternoon, their last feed will be Thursday afternoon, correct? Ideally, Thursday afternoon, or I may give like a few in the morning, Friday, a few like pecs or whatever. Not not even a half, not right. even not even five grams. So let's say maybe two grams, something like that. Okay, okay. So tell me this, Antonio. When you say y'all guys travel, how far do y'all typically? Uh, you know, how far do y'all guys travel to Manila? Oh, it's not far. It's not like in the U.S. where they drive for like oh. hours. No, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm only like an hour and a half to two hours out, depending on traffic. Oh. Okay, and what you travel in? What do they travel in? Uh, pickup truck. Well, in, inside, they travel in the aircon. Okay, so they y'all guys got those travel boxes like we like they use here in oh, the, the States? Boxes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, similar. But ours are uh, either cardboard or plastic. Okay, so what have, kind of bedding do have you have inside of there? Uh, they they put like a banana leaf, okay, or sometimes okay. uh, uh, corn shucks, but then they might scratch. More on banana leaf. That's the ideal one. Ideal. So you don't want them in there scratching for anything. Yeah, but like uh, if we were just to travel chickens, just for traveling them, right? Like let's say I'm shipping to like a customer or something, they'll go with right. like uh, either corn shucks or like a uh, shredded newspaper. Okay. Yeah. But going to the pit, they're going to be in there with a banana leaf. 
banana leaf or like uh, some a similar similar plant. I guess banana would Type be the easiest to explain. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we got that. We got pretty much down. And 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 guys, I know y'all been asking a lot of comments and. and and uh, and Tony, if you can, you know, after the show, if you can get to it between the day and tomorrow, there's a lot of questions uh, in the comment oh. section, which we had already talked about this beforehand anyway. And obviously, guys, y'all know I can't ask him all of these kind of questions, just way too many. The interview has already ran his battery down and now he's trying to hold the phone. Um, but let me get a few more. Qu we already over an hour and a half, but I want to just get a few more questions in um, um, before we let you go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, you know. You said the birds are very agile. Can you tell us, like, what type of conformation or body structure y'all guys, how y'all guys like y'all birds? Well, me, I, I breed, like, mostly, I breed the old old bloodlines, uh, the hatch, the claret, the gray. And, like, uh, I personally believe I can't change their conformation because they already win okay. at that certain conformation. If I were to, to change the conformation, it might not match the style in which they fight. Right. Right. So, so I, tell I, I keep them close to the breed standard, really, like medium station. Even here, some consider them a bit low station. But that's okay. that's what they win at, right? If I were right. to change it, I, and I, I have tried changing it, the it really it doesn't match. The style of the chicken right. and the confirmation have to match. If you right. had, like, let's say, a, a round head, a Kelso, a sweater type chicken, you could go for you could go for the height. Right, you can right. add the height. Uh, yeah, that, that that's what that's what I would say. You got uh, it's frozen. So, so oh, it's getting cut. It, 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 yeah, it had froze up for a second. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you can hear me now. So basically, what you were saying is, you know, obviously you stuck to the to the original standards for that for that line, and uh, you said in some some instances it might seem like they're a little short, but for their style, their confirmation matches their style. Correct. 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 Okay, so uh, when you picking out, I want to just talk a little bit about the the breeding standards. You said it there there. The standards of what that breed is, but when you look and you're going to pick a stag or brood cock, you know how do you like him? Do you like him with the wide back, or you just say, "Hey, the closest he is to the breeding standard is how I'm going to judge him." Um, I guess so. I guess so. The closest to the standard, like uh, as much as possible, I'll pick. I'll try and go for like the most uh, perfect specimen, right? If there's one with like, if there's a batch of five brothers and one looks kind of odd, I might not. I might not touch him, right? Right. I might try and look for the ones that are more a more uniform, uniform to that to that marking, right? Right. Uh, I guess I'd I'd prefer one with a little a little more height. I wouldn't breed the shortest, the shortest one in the batch, right? Okay. But uh, in general, I I don't breed stags. I I only breed cocks. Okay. Uh, in general, like. Like I said, like I've noticed, once you use words that want as stags, maybe I, a couple of times I used an uh, exceptional stag derby winner as a broodcock. Okay. But ideally, I prefer to breed uh, cocks and hens. Two years. Cocks old. and hens. Yeah. So, so tell me this. Give us a little bit information about what you look for in your hens. Oh, in the hens, oh, definitely uh, the body. I like solid body, good bone structure. Uh, I don't like. Uh, too like a flighty of a hen okay or more, more like calm i like calm calm roosters and hens. okay yeah calm roosters and calm hens yeah um how about and the eye color. color uh red definitely I, ideally red but you know some lines are, don't come as as red. i'm not i'm not super uh anal about like I, i'm not like one of those guys like it's got to be red eyes means health I'm not like that, but uh, of course, I would breed towards a redder uh, eye, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. But I'm not, too, type. Like, I'm, it's not for me, it's not like a, it's not like a big indicator on the quality of the chicken. Okay. I've okay. Seen From your experience, you haven't really, you haven't seen good. Yeah, I've seen birds with like, you know, 
that can that can get the money, even though their eyes aren't as, you know. But of course, to please like buyers and and customers, you would want like super red eyed chickens. Okay, okay, but but throughout your experience, you have seen good ones perform with all kinds of colored eyes. Oh, in fighting, yeah, yeah. Wow. So tell me this: uh, Do you think with them what they're doing now? Uh, with the stag derbies becoming more popular, do you think that's going to help the quality of the chickens over the years, or you think that may hurt the quality of chickens over the years? And I asked that question because that was a big question in Puerto Rico when they started showing birds at an earlier age. That was a big controversy. That's a good question. Uh, it's definitely changing breeding. Uh, it is. Especially with the... With, uh, I, I really don't know how to answer that one. Um, in a way, uh, birds will be proven earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Can you say they're even proven, though? You haven't given them full time to mature, right? Right. I don't, I'm on the fence. I don't know. Could be either way. Right, right. On the fence either way. Yeah, and I asked that question because I know that was a big, that was a very hot topic uh, when they did that in Puerto Rico. It's like some guys like, oh, it's going to, you know, hurt the birds and then the others like no it's going to improve them so it's all over the place but tell me this tony you know so we can we can kind of because i, I know mean, it's getting it's going to improve them for their purpose if your purpose is to fight them that time of year they're just going to get better and better for that time of year now how they right. be as cocks i i don't know uh right. i know it might not be as big a difference here in the long night it's a shorter fight so right uh but uh yeah, it would improve the birds for their purpose, definitely. Right. Definitely. Okay. If it would benefit you to change your breeding to uh, compete in that specific event, that I don't know. I don't know. Right. I, I, personally, I haven't experienced fighting in these early. They call the early bird derbies. I right. don't really. I don't really feel the need to to participate in them at the moment. Okay. But I knowing. The Filipino cockers is just gonna they're just gonna get better and better and better. Everyone just That's right. Them. Just like they deal with them off colors, huh? Yeah, it's very competitive here. Right. Well, and I guess they showed that with them off color birds, huh? They started out one way and, yeah. and now look at them now, they just as tough as nails. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I think we went you gave us a lot, a lot of great information. Uh uh Jay you know, who made this interview happen, he has a really good question that didn't even cross my mind, uh, was the fact that Jay said, if you can share, you know, uh, your experience, because obviously you didn't compete internationally, you know, with Hawaii, Guam and stuff like that. You know, if you can kind of, oh, yeah. if we could talk a little bit about, you know, let's just start with Guam, you know, uh, going to Guam, you know, how did the, how did the chickens look? How did they perform? You know, what, what kind of stood out there? This is like, uh, for me, uh, of course, I really enjoyed this part of my life. But like uh, what chicken fighting has done, I've been able to go around around the world, actually, for for, right. for the, this game, right? Uh, when I was younger, my father took me to the Bayou Club in Louisiana. I was wow. able to see. The, the, yeah, that was like 2002, a few years before they, they shut down. Right. Uh, then... Uh, Obviously, I, I've been uh, fighting a lot of birds here, especially during the mid two thousands. We were uh, very active on mm -hmm. like the major major circuit, and I kind of developed a little like uh, mm -hmm. following online, right? And okay. like mm -hmm. one day, I I got a uh, a message from this guy who wanted to uh, finance my chickens in the world slash, and he wanted to back it, right? And, okay. Um, he was from Guam. And his name was Owen. And, like, he's one of my, my closest friends today. He came over here, and we've been fighting, like, partners for a long time in the big derbies. And uh, the people from Guam and, and Saipan, you know, Jay's from Saipan. Jay's not from Guam. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, they're, they're, like, great people. I, like, they've become, like, family friends already to me. And... Uh, to me and my dad and my family, my mom, oh, very close. And so after like, I don't know, one or two times of them uh, coming over here where they use my chickens to compete, I said, uh, hey, we're going to go over there. 
and we'll visit you guys and we want to see your derby. And that's the right. Thanksgiving Derby in Guam. That's like a real big thing. They get like close to 100 entries. And uh, right. I don't know if I've been there. I've been going the last four or five of them. And oh, we wow. really enjoy. Of course, I can't bring my chickens there because it's right. U.S. Uh, territory. So uh, we use our friends' chickens. Uh, they have their own chickens there, and they, they do a good job too. And, you know, we enjoy the, the sport. is a bit different there. Uh a bit more Americanized, a bit rowdier, right? Like right. here in the Philippines, like no one cheers like during the chicken fight. Everyone's quiet. Because right. if you celebrate and you cheer before your chicken actually wins, if something happens, oh, they're going to let you have it here. Right? <laughs> Every, everyone's quiet. Every, everyone's tense. And I, I, you know, a lot, a lot of people here, they're, they're, betting, they're betting quite big, right? More than they can afford, right? right? So right. everyone's like quiet. They're, you know, they're pretty loud there. And they let you know. <laughs> They're Americans. They let you hear. They let you know. <laughs> American citizens. Right? And then, yo, man, eventually I went to Hawaii, and they're even louder there. That's like the wildest thing I've ever seen is the cockfight in Hawaii. <laughs> you think the two pinners are going to fight? Like, oh, this is crazy. And then I, I went to, I, earlier this year, I was in Cambodia. I went to Cambodia for chicken fights, so... Uh, pretty lucky to uh, to have experienced all of that at like right you know but uh, so like I had this uh, partnership with my friends from Guam and uh, what we did was we promoted a derby here the Guam Philippines mm -hmm. Derby uh, and we invited like the the top guys from from Guam to come over and then we okay. matched them with like some t tough top Filipino entries and okay. that was that was a big success, and then we we replicated it in like a smaller version, like just a two cock right. derby. So like right. the, the locals who can't afford to join a big six cock, they could join right. like a little two cock and say, "Oh, I fought like the best cock fighters from Guam," and like right. it's, it's like a big thing. They 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 anticipated here, like, "Oh, the Guamanians are here. Oh, we're gonna fight them," and like you know, like people right. come into, the, "Hey, what's the score? Who's winning? Guam, Philippines?" And then like right. It's really, it's really fun, and like through through that, I've met, I met a lot of good people in Guam, and then eventually I met some friends from Hawaii, and right. you know they've all been like like uh, close. They've been all like family to to me and my family, and like I, I go there, they 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 host us there. They come here, and like we all just kind of like help each other. We all have like uh, the same goal, and we like, right. kind of like work towards the same the same goal, and it makes a uh, it makes the sport more enjoyable when you have like uh, friends like that. That's right. That that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that and that's that's some you know that those are the kind of experiences that many people would never understand, especially if they're not in a sport. They don't understand the value of those type of experiences and those type of relationships that you have created all over the world just through chickens itself. Um, yeah. But 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 Antonio, what happened? Some go. <laughs> No, no, nothing. Oh, uh, what what I was going to ask you also too was, you know, besides the hooting and the hollering from the from the uh, you know, from the from the stands, you know, did you see a difference in the styles of the chickens itself? Oh well, in uh, in Guam, they fight pretty similar to uh, Philippine style. Okay, I mean, the rules are almost similar, just the difference of the peck. It's only one peck in okay. Guam. In the Philippines, it's two. But in and okay. there's so many. Uh, Filipinos there that the the style of chicken and the, they like it's the same trends really they'll right. follow like what's going on here they it's going on there too right uh, right in, in Hawaii it was much uh, it's different the birds like they come rushing in they break like six seven feet in the air uh, wow it's it's different the fight there is different it's not it's uh, more Amer uh, more I don't know, closer to uh, Western style, I guess. Okay, okay. Yeah, but they they fight long knife there too. Right, yeah. right. So you you definitely see a difference in the birds from Guam and Hawaii. Well, well, you said Guam is pretty much similar. The birds fight pretty much similar to to Philippines, right? Yeah, yeah, um, similar, but more on they got they're using a lot of U.S. bred chicken, so still uh, a bit. Not similar, but not, not the same. Right. 
Right. Well, funny how and they, more like get after each other and like it's a quick quicker fight, more more it's decided more in the air. Right. Oh, in Hawaii it is, huh? Yeah. At least I've only been there once though. So that's from what I saw, that's what it looked like. There's a, a Okay. Yeah. And uh then of course I, I went to uh Cambodia and that's that's crazy too. That they fight in the gaff there. Right. Yeah, and uh, that's interesting because there I can send my chickens there, so I see my my roosters compete in like a totally different uh, weapon, and that's very we- interesting. Weapon, because like here uh, we only fight really long knife. If ever there's like a short knife derby, or it's more like a novelty event, it's never gonna okay. be something we breed towards. Like, oh, I want to win the short knife. There, no, no, or no one's gonna do that. But uh, right. now I'm sending roosters abroad. And so I have to think about like birds that will be able to to win there. And uh, luckily, like my birds that I use here, they're doing pretty good over there. So wow, uh, I, I mean, it was very interesting. I went there in January this year, uh, eye opening, eye opening trip. Wow! So you got an opportunity now to for your birds to be proven in a gaff, which everybody always say, you know, yeah. gaff take a game rooster. Yeah, it, it, it's different rules there, though. So it's not the same. It's like uh, uh, they, if the rooster can't stand up, they call the fight there. So If he not, can't stand? Yeah. So it, it's not really uh, a full test of gameness. But, of course, it's still different from like uh, what we have in the Philippines. Right. Like, it's a, a different right. weapon. The, the cutting is much more important than the gaff, I think. You'll see... A real cutting chicken. Here, they're so advanced already with the technology and the knife and like the method right. of how to tie the knife that you can get away with like you can get away with it, right? But there, you really, I, I see, you really need a good cutting bird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause that with that whole different weapon, it ain't just a brush up on the feathers, you know, and 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 you got to cut there. Yeah. You actually got to dig it in. Yeah, it's totally totally different, but uh. So far, I, I don't know. They've been doing pretty good out there. So I, wow, I, we we actually we promoted uh, a derby. Uh, we called it the Asian Gaff Championship, uh, three cock derby, and we had people from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Australia come over, and they fought in the gaff, and it was like a, you know a new experience. The, the crowd was like, "Wow, this is something new." And some people laughed at it, some people enjoyed it, and uh, right, right, you know, trying trying out different things, right. Right. How how big is the weapon over there? How big is the gaff? You know, it's basically a, a long heel, but uh, instead of a socket, it's a it's like a kind of like a fork. Uh, not really, but I I wish I could get one. I got one, but uh, it's too far. We'll, we'll okay. Listeners waiting too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? Later on, if you can, when you get chance, you can take a picture of it and post it in the comment section. That'd be great. Oh, I'll, I'll post it on your group. I have pictures. Okay, of the great. Uh, I'll, great. I'll, I'll, I'll post it on the group. Great. Yeah. Well, listen, Antonio, man, this has been an awesome. All, I, I can sit here and talk to you for three or four hours. We already pushing it to two hour mark. Like I like I told you before we came on. Well, listen, I um I would like for you to come on again if you if if you know if you would be okay with that. You know, do a part two to this because I know once we go in the comment section, it's going to be a lot of stuff that we we didn't get an opportunity to cover. So if you can come on at a later date and maybe we can address some of those questions, that'd be great. Um, if you have time, you know, later on between the day or tomorrow or something, if you can answer some of the questions that's in the comment section, that'd be great. It's probably about 200 questions in there. So I don't expect you to get to all of them. But um, we're if, locked it, down it, here. We got, we got nothing to do. We can't leave our house till like mid April. Oh, well, shoot. That's even better than, hey, man, we might have you come back on before the quarantine's over. We don't have nothing but time. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we can get through this thing. It's pretty crazy, man. Yeah, we, we, I guess we're the last of the uh, we're the last of the group to get it. So it it it's it's starting to get bad here. It's not as bad as it is, you know, in the rest of the world, but it's starting to get you know a little bit bad. Every day. they 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 doing their best to try to contain it and, and, and try to keep our lives as close as normal as possible. Here, everyone lives close, so everyone's like worried and stuff, man. <laughs> but anyway, right. you know, uh, the Lord will take care of us, man. That's right. exactly right.
That's exactly. You got to have that faith. So listen, Antonio, it was a pleasure and an honor to have you on this evening. Um, I think we went into a lot of in-depth parts of the conversation um, and, and details of your whole entire program from the breeding to the chick care to the stag care. And you taught a lot of tricks to the trade. I think that a lot of guys be able to use here in the States or actually wherever they located because there's people from all over uh, watching the interview. But uh, I will uh, like to have you come on again, um, hopefully sooner than later, just depending on the situation there. But uh, since you got time, we might have you come on a lot sooner. Um, Problem. Anyway, just, just message me. I'm, I I'm, sure I'm will, man. <laughs> I totally understand, man. I guess we all dealing with it. You know, we all dealing with it now. But like I say, have a good evening. You know, okay. we greatly appreciate you coming on, man, and sharing your experience with us, man. I think we'll all, you know, we have all learned something new tonight. I'm pretty sure we have. But I would like for you to have a good evening. Stay in touch. We're going to have you come back on the show soon. And uh, stay focused, stay positive, and stay blessed. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank all right, you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All righty, guys. That was Antonio uh, with the um, Antonio and, and Micah Game Farm in the Philippines. Um, you know, it was a great, great interview. He went into a depth with a lot, a lot of information. I know y'all guys had a lot of questions in the comments section. Y'all kind of know how we do these interviews. Obviously, we cannot uh, ask all of those questions during the interview. Um, but like he said, he has time, so he'll come into the interview section. I mean, into the uh, comment section, and he will, um, you know, address a lot of those questions that y'all had in there. I think we covered a lot, though. A lot of the questions that came up in the comment section had already been answered in the interview. So probably the best thing to do is to relook at the interview from the beginning. If you came in mid section or or closer to the end, because a lot of the questions, like I say, were already answered um, um, during the interview. But he kind of took us through the whole deal. You know, um, it's amazing how, you know, he doesn't use a lot of medications. He does use a lot. But the vaccinations was the thing that would just like really caught me off guard. I didn't know they had to vaccinate for so much stuff. But he explained why they did. Um, but we all know Filipino has some excellent, excellent products when it comes to medication, wormers, all that kind of stuff. And uh, and for him not to really use that much, I mean, he's close to natural as possible. Um, and it seems like, you know, again, they're adjusting their program as the times change. Um, like he said, you know, the off colors came in around the early 2000s. They were they were flighty birds. You know, once they got hit, they hit the road. But he said they're becoming a lot more durable, a lot more tough. Um, and one of the challenging things in Philippines is the fact that, you know, you got to keep ahead of the curve. The birds are constantly getting better. Everybody's just kind of doing research and development. You know, they out in the pit seeing what's winning, what needs to be done. And they come back and they try to tweak their breeding program um, to what they need to do to stay competitive. Um, it's amazing how he said that, you know, they're still using the same birds that they kind of been using since the early 80s. You know, keeping that same foundation. And even keeping the same breeding standards, uh, which is amazing because, again, if that's the case, his birds are pretty much built like Western style birds. So, you know, that's very interesting that he's still sticking to the breeding standards that of, of, of those bloodlines. So whatever those bloodlines breeding standards were, that's kind of what he's sticking with, which was very interesting because sometimes we hear people, you know, in the Philippines, you got to have a different style, you know, a different built bird due to the fact that the weapon is so long. I know I have heard it. I don't know if y'all guys have, but I know I have heard it um, uh, many, many times. So it was very interesting to hear him say that he still stick to the same breeding standards of those bloodlines that they acquired uh, uh, from the state. So that was amazing. Um, and then, like I say, talked about traveling, talked about feed. You know, we didn't, you know, he talked about his keep. His keep is mainly rotation. But like he said, with them competing so much all different times, there's no sketched in stone keep. So he really couldn't take us to exactly how they do their keep besides the fact that he used rotation, fly pins, scratch pins. Um, you know, he said his fly pins, you know, he have some of the roost poles, you know, seven, eight feet high. Um, he talked about, you know, his hardened pins. You know, some of them are just a small four by fours. The, some of the other ones are, you know, I guess he said like four by six by six with the roost pole about chest high. You know, you don't want to have them too high to stress the roost, to stress the stag out. Um, then he talked about putting, you know, a hen in there with a stag when he pulls them off the free range and put them in there to kind of help them mentally adjust and acclimate it to being inside that uh, hardened pin. 
Um, and I think, again, if you go back through this interview, he dropped a lot of jewels, a lot of information, you know, putting the strap on a stag uh, leg, you know, to get him used to having a strap on his leg instead of, you know, taking him out the hardening pin. And the first time he feel a strap is when you put him on a tie cord. So, you know, I think uh, it's a lot of really, really good information that we can apply and use in our program. Some stuff we can use, some stuff we can't. But like always, just take the stuff that you think you can use, you know, try something new. Like you say, you got to stay open-minded. It's, you know, to stay ahead of that curve, you got to stay open-minded. Um, and you got to be able to, you know, tweak your breeding program. It doesn't mean you got to get totally away from the foundation, but you got to make some breed selections to kind of keep up with the times. Um, so again, man, I think it's, uh, it was very, very interesting to hear him talk about, you know, the difference between the Filipino bu uh, birds, you know, the birds in Guam, the birds in uh, Cambodia, the birds in Hawaii. I mean, it, it, it was very, very interesting. It was a, a, another, another great interview. Um, and then again, I want to, uh, uh, thank Jay. I greatly appreciate you, you know, making this interview happen. Uh, when you reached out to me about it, like I tell everybody, you know, I get a lot of, uh, suggestions of people, uh, to interview, but y'all guys got to understand, you know, I'm not an encyclopedia or I don't have a Rolodex. I don't know all of these American and Filipino and Guam and Hawaii, you know, breeders. So, you know, a lot of times some of the people you, you, you guys suggest to me, I don't know them. Um, so I always say, if you want to suggest that I interview somebody, reach out to that person first, you know, because one of the and I, I'm very short on time. I have a lot of stuff going on. You know, it, it, it's it's better for me. You know, I don't really have time to reach out to somebody who really is not interested in doing an interview. You know, that's what I do know. If, if they on a fence about it, don't even suggest them to me. If they don't want to do, uh, you know, if they're not 100 percent sure. Don't waste your time suggesting them to me because, again, I don't really have time to communicate with that person when they never had any interest in doing the interview anyway. Um, it's just so many other people out here that we can interview, um, and, and people don't do the interviews for multiple different reasons, and I don't take that person at all. You know, if a person don't want to do an interview, I totally understand, you know, and I just move on to the next. Um, it's no big deal, um, but uh, try to bring on – you know, the best um, people that we can get access to that's willing to come on, try to make these interviews um, as information, uh, as much information as possible. Like to talk about some history, you know. Um, so, again, you know, just try to bring them out, bring the best that we can bring. Um, everybody who's come on the show has something to bring to the table. We have brought big breeders on the show, small breeders on the show, mid-level breeders on the show. All different backgrounds, all different experience levels, and from all different parts of the world and the country. And I think that's extremely important also because it allows you to get some information that might fit your situation. You know, having somebody who we interview from El Paso, Texas, living in a very, very dry climate, that interview may help somebody who's living in that same type of situation. You know, interviewing somebody who live in an area with a lot of rain, a high humidity. That interview is going to help somebody with that same type of situation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, go on and on and on. So, again, you know, every one of these interviews will be the greatest interview for somebody watching, you know, um, and there's no no there's no competition. You know, it's just a bunch of information. You take it all. You apply what you can apply to your program. Everybody's doing something different. And that is one of the biggest keys. It truly shows you that. You know, it. it, it you know what? One of the things I learned from these interviews to probably not even use the word common sense. The reason why I say don't even use the word common sense, because if you look at all these interviews, some of these people do stuff completely different. I mean, completely different. And then they do stuff that you ain't never heard of. So in all actuality, I don't even think it is any common sense in these chickens. You know, that's that's kind of how I feel. You know, um, and that's kind of how I always felt, because, again, if you don't know, you don't know. Um, and if you're new to this sport, um, it's a lot of stuff that you you're not going to know. And the worst thing you need is for somebody to tell you use common sense. Well, the thing is, if you ain't never raised no chickens, you don't have no chicken common sense anyway. Um, so, again, I think, uh, you know, go through all of these interviews. You know, we're in quarantine right now. That's the reason why I put this together. Ten back to back interviews. Believe me, it's exhausting also for me uh, because, again, not only am I doing these interviews, but I'm doing a lot of 
uh, stuff during the day, you know, with responding to all these comments, all these messages. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. It ain't just me getting on the screen for two hours and doing an interview. It's a lot of other stuff that goes on behind the scenes to get these candidates on, work with people's schedules, go over there with them some topics, their strong points, all that. You know, all that stuff goes on behind the scenes before we even get this interview on. So I'm extremely busy. I have a lot going on. And I can tell you now, I even told my wife, I said, man, Maybe I shouldn't have did these 10 back to back because, whoo, it's exhausting. It's extremely exhausting mentally and physically. Um, and it seems like the time comes so quick. You know, by the time I get off the phone, off the computer, respond to the messages, like, uh oh, I got to get ready to go do an interview. You know, then we got to do mic check, video check. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I can tell you, after this 10, I'm going to probably need a little break. You know, because I'm exhausted already with all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes to make these interviews happen. So I hope y'all guys really appreciate them. It's a ton of information. And we should always thank the special guests to come on to tell us, in, you know, their journey and their experience because all of these interviews help people. Um, and that's why I kind of been behind a little bit, you know, on getting the interviews uploaded to YouTube because that takes about three hours per interview. To download it. I don't know if y'all guys know, but this ain't like no phone. It takes a long time to download. And I don't care what kind of Wi-Fi you have. It takes a long time to download these interviews outside of this software. And then it takes a long time for YouTube. For When you try to upload them to YouTube, it takes a long time because at first it got to upload and then it has to process. That's a two-part thing when you upload a video to YouTube. You know what I'm saying? You got you to gotta upload it. It takes a long time to do that. And then once it's uploaded, YouTube processes it. So I up I download it from the software. And then from the software, I upload it to YouTube. And then once it's uploaded to YouTube, then it has to process through YouTube. And then you got to do three steps after that for the video to be available. So um, tonight I did about four. You know, well, not even tonight, today. Today I did about four. Um, and I'm telling you, it's mentally exhausting. So I hope y'all guys going over to the YouTube channel. Um, I get a lot of messages. Where can I find the interviews? Where can I find the interviews? I don't know how many times I have to tell y'all guys, go over to the YouTube channel. Some of y'all guys are just refusing to do it, you know, and I think I do enough by doing the interviews. I cannot, I do not have the time to scroll through a timeline and find an interview for you and feed it to you like on a plate. I'm not going to do it. I made the interview. I put it on my page. I put it in a group. You have to take the time to find it. I am not going to do that anymore because I realize that that has taken up a whole bunch of my time searching particular interviews for people. Take the time. If it take you three hours to find it, well, you know what? It took me three hours to find it because I got to do the same identical thing you have to do to find that interview. I'm not doing it anymore. I got way too much stuff on my plate. I don't have time to do it. Um, if you want to watch a lot of the interviews, go over to Journey to the Pit 362 University. I don't know why some of y'all guys are refusing to do it. Go over there. Vast majority of the interviews are on there. I still got more to upload, but it's enough on there to keep you busy. Um, also, too, I know many of y'all guys are not interested in a podcast, but anybody who's interested in a podcast, Journey to the Pit 362 podcast, you can get it on Spotify, Anchor, Google. You can get it on a whole bunch of different podcast platforms. So um, I will be uploading the audio of these interviews uh, onto the podcast so y'all guys can listen to them in your vehicles. Y'all guys can listen to them when y'all when you're at work. You don't have to worry about having YouTube open. So. You know, I'm doing my part. I'm doing as much as I can do. But it's just getting to a point where this stuff is starting to become unmanageable because I'm just getting a lot of requests for a lot of things. It's like guys don't want to put in the time. I'm already doing enough, and I'm getting to the point where I have to start telling people no. You know, I'm just not going to do it. I got too much other stuff to worry about. Um, but other than that, man, that's pretty much it. Again, um, I'll upload this interview over to YouTube. I got to get Jay Riddles on there. Uh, from Hawk Pride Farms. I, I thought I had his on there. I looked tonight. His is not on there, so I got to get his on there. I'll get Antonio's on there um, probably by tomorrow. Um, I'll get to some of y'all guys' comments. I'm looking at my screen right now. I got a whole, I got 83 messages. Let me see. I'm sorry. I got 63. I got 63 messages. 63 messages it, it, since I've been on this interview. 63 messages. And I'm going to try to go through them 63 messages and answer all those messages before I call it a night. 
So that just gives y'all guys an idea of what I got to deal with behind the scenes other than these interviews. So I just ask y'all guys to have some common courtesy, you know, put in the work. I did my part. I got the interview made. Search for it. Find it. Go over to YouTube. Like the YouTube page. And again, guys, I'm asking you. A lot of people ask, Jim, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Well, you know what y'all guys can do? And I'll say it again. Share the interviews. Share the interviews. Share them to the groups. Share them to your pages. Share the YouTube channel. That's what y'all guys can do. Because it's going to come to a point where if it's not many people watching this stuff, there's not going to be a reason for me to make it. So if y'all guys don't want to take the time to share the information, then eventually I'll just stop making the information. And it's a lot of y'all guys share a whole bunch of stuff that does nothing for your personal life or for the game file industry. Y'all share a whole bunch of politics, a whole bunch of all kinds of stuff, and that's your right because that's your page. I'm not telling you not to do that. But I'm asking you if you're a game foul breeder, do the fraternity a favor by sharing some information because if somebody can be on your page that can learn from one of these interviews, you watched it, share it. I'm not making anything off of it. But what I am trying to do is, is trying to educate as many people as possible. Everybody on Facebook been sharing Corona, 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 Coronavirus. I look at those people pages. They ain't share one interview, not one. And I know they watch the interview because I see them in the comment section. So I don't know what it is, but it will eventually become a time. If the information is not getting out there, I'm not making these videos for 300 people. It's just that simple. So if y'all want the interviews to keep coming, share the information. Why? We got to make a positive impact on a whole sport. It's not about you just getting the information. We got to get the information to the masses, to the masses, not just you. You watch the interview. Why are you not sharing the interview? You scared somebody going to learn something and whoop you? I mean, come on now. That's the that's that goes against the whole purpose of making these interviews. So, you know, like I said, guys, if, if you want to do something for Jim Collins, share the information, share the interviews. Share the YouTube channel. That's what you can do for me. I'm not asking for any money. I'm not asking for none of that. I'm asking y'all to do something simple. Share it like if it was the coronavirus. Share it like if it was something about Donald Trump. Share it if it was like something about Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. Share it like if it was a funny video. Share it. Y'all share a whole bunch of other trash. Share this. I don't know what what why is it so difficult, but share it. We got it's a lot more people we need to teach besides yourself. I don't know why we hoard this information. So again, that's my rant, but I had to say it because again, I put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of sacrifice. I'm not spending with my family down here in this studio in this basement making this stuff and it gets shared three or four times. It makes no logical sense for me to keep doing it. So y'all guys make I'm leaving the ball in y'all court. Share it. We continue. You don't share, I'll stop making it. It's just that simple. Other than that, I hope all y'all guys enjoy the post that I'm trying to keep up uh, throughout the week to bring some laughs in our life and have something to laugh about and crack jokes about. And hopefully the interviews, you'll enjoy the interviews. Um, and, you know, again, I'm just trying to make some funny little posts to get get some of us laughing because some of everybody's not in the same mental state. And, you know, this being this quarantine is a lot harder on some people than others. So I hope you all guys enjoyed the interview. Please watch the whole entire interview. If you came in in the middle, the end, or not at the beginning, I suggest that you watch the whole entire interview before you post a comment. Because some comments are being posted of stuff that has already been answered. That's just telling me you haven't watched the whole interview. So please watch the whole entire interview. And go on over to Journey to the Pit 362 YouTube channel. And then also download the Journey to the Pit 362 podcast. Um, other than that. Y'all guys have a good night. Stay focused, stay positive, stay blessed, and I will see y'all guys tomorrow, same place, same time. Have a good evening.